Letters of Oscar Wilde, Volume Three, eighteen ninety five to eighteen ninety seven. To Ada Leverson. From the Catalogue of the Stetson Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Marland. Lot 317. Autograph letter signed, four pages, octavo. From H. M. Prison. To Mrs. Leverson. Signed, Oscar. Dear Sphinx and Ernest, I write to you from prison where your kind words have reached me and given me comfort, though they have made me cry in my loneliness. Not that I am really alone. A slim thing, gold-haired like an angel, stands always at my side. His presence overshadows me. He moves in the gloom like a white flower. With what a crash this fell! Why did the Sibyl say fair things? I thought but to defend him for his father, etc. End of section To Moore Aidy and Robert Ross, 9th of April, 1895, from the Catalogue of the Dallau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 4. Autograph letter signed, from Wilde, on the notepaper of Holloway Jail. Dated, not by Wilde, 9th of April, 1895. Addressed to Moore Aidy and Bobby. Four pages, octavo. Will you tell the Sphinx, Ernest Leverson, Mrs. Bernard Beer, Church Cottage, Marylebone Road, how deeply touched I am by their affection and kindness. Inform the committee of the New Travellers Club, and also of the Albemarle, that I resign my membership, Piccadilly and Dover Street. They are kind in their way here, but I have no books, nothing to smoke, and sleep very badly. Signed, Oscar. Ask Bobby to go to Tite Street and get a typewritten manuscript, part of my blank verse tragedy, also a black book containing La Sainte Courtesane in Bedroom. End of section. To Robert Ross, 16th of April, 1895, from Oscar Wilde, The Story of an Unhappy Friendship, by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Wilde, H.M. Prison, Holloway, 16th of April, 1895. My dear Robert, you good, daring, reckless friend, I was delighted to get your letter with all its wonderful news. For myself, I am ill, apathetic. Slowly life creeps out of me. Nothing but Alfred Douglas's daily visits quicken me into life, and even him I only see under humiliating and tragic conditions. Don't fight more than six duels a week. I suppose Sarah is hopeless, but your chivalrous friendship, your fine chivalrous friendship, is worth more than all the money in the world. Yours, Oscar. End of section. To Ada Leverson, from Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My dear Sphinx, Today Bosey comes early to see me. My counsel seems to wish the case to be tried at once. I don't, nor does Bosey. Bail or no bail, I think we had better wait. I have seen counsel and Bosey. I don't know what to do. My life seems to have gone from me. I feel caught in a terrible net. I don't know where to turn. I care less when I think that he is thinking of me. 
I think of nothing else. Oscar. End of section. To Ada Leveson, 5th of March, 1895, from the Catalogue of the Stetson Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 333. Autograph letter signed, four pages, octavo, H.M. Prison, Holloway, March 5th, 1895. To Mrs. Leveson, with addressed envelope. Signed, Oscar. Dear and wonderful Sphinx, if I do not get bail today, will you send me some books? I would like some. Stevenson's The Master of Ballantrae and Kidnapped. Now that he is away, I have no one who brings me books, so I come to you. For you and Ernest are so good to me that I am glad to think that I can never repay you. Always your gratitude and affection. End of section. To Ada Leveson, from the Catalogue of the Stetson Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 330. Autograph letter signed. Two pages, octavo, undated. To Mrs. Leveson. Signed, Oscar. With addressed envelope. Ernest's Shakespeare has arrived safe, and I hear your books are below. I hope I shall be allowed to have them, as Sunday is such a long day here, I had two letters from John Quill today to make up, and I saw Frank Harris. I believe I come out on Tuesday next. I must see you, of course, etc. Lot 331. Autograph letter signed, four pages, Octavo, H.M. Prison, Holloway, June 5th, 1895. To Mrs. Leveson, with addressed envelope. Signed, Oscar. My dear Sphinx, I have not had a line today from Fleur de Lys. I suppose he is at ruin. I am so wretched when I don't hear from him, and today I am bored and sick of the death of imprisonment. Oh, I hope all will come well, and that I can go back to art and life. Here I sicken in inanition. End of section. Lord Alfred Douglas to Oscar Wilde, 15th of May, 1895. From Oscar Wilde, His Life and Confessions, by Frank Harris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A letter from Lord Alfred Douglas to Oscar Wilde that I reproduce here speaks for itself and settles once for all, I imagine, the question of their relations. Had Lord Alfred Douglas not denied the truth and posed as Oscar Wilde's patron, I should never have published this letter, though it was given to me to establish the truth. This letter was written between Oscar's first and second trial, Ten days later, Oscar Wilde was sentenced to two years' imprisonment with hard labour. Frank Harris Hotel de Deux Mondes, 22 Avenue de la Opera, 22, Paris, Wednesday, May 15th, 1895. My darling Oscar, have just arrived here. It seems too dreadful to be here without you, but I hope you will join me next week. Dieppe was too awful for anything. It is the most depressing place in the world. Even petty Chavot was not to be had as the casino was closed. They are very nice here, and I can stay as long as I like without paying my bill, which is a good thing, as I am quite penniless. The proprietor is very nice and most sympathetic. He asked after you at once and expressed his regret and indignation at the treatment you had received— I shall have to send this by a cab to the Gare du Nord to catch the post, as I want you to get it first post tomorrow. I'm going to see if I can find Robert Sherard tomorrow if he is in Paris. Charlie is with me and sends you his best love. 
i had a long letter from moore adie this morning about you do keep up your spirits my dearest darling i continue to think of you day and night and i send you all my love i am always your own loving and devoted boy Bosey. End of section. Constance Wilde to Robert Sherard. From Oscar Wilde, The Story of an Unhappy Friendship. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dear Mr. Sherard, your letter has only this moment reached me, but I came over to London last evening in the hope of getting the permission to go to Wandsworth and found it waiting here for me. I have written to the governor, and I expect to see Oscar some time to-morrow, so I hope you will see him on Monday. I am not seeing any one at all, but if you care to come here on Tuesday, and climb many flights of stairs, should be very glad to see you. Very sincerely yours, Constance Wilde. I don't want anyone to know that I am in London on the following day i received a second letter from her it showed me that i had not mistaken the poor girl's beautiful heart my dear mr sherard it was indeed awful more so than i had any conception it could be i could not see him and i could not touch him and i scarcely spoke come and see me before you go to him on monday at any time after two i can see you when i go again i am to get at the home secretary through mr blank and try and get a room to see him in and touch him again he has been mad the last three years and he says that if he saw blank he would kill him so he had better keep away and be satisfied with having marred a fine life few people can boast of so much I thank you for your kindness to a fallen friend. You are kind and gentle to him, and you are, I think, the only person he can bear to see. Yours most truly, Constance Wilde. End of section. To Robert Ross, 10th of March, 1896. From De Profundis, 1907 Keller edition. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 10th of March, 1896. My dear Robbie, I want you to have a letter written at once to Mr. Blank, the solicitor, stating that as my wife has promised to settle a third on me in the case of her predeceasing me, I do not wish any opposition to be made to her purchasing my life interest. I feel that I have brought such unhappiness on her and such ruin on my children that I have no right to go against her wishes in anything. She was gentle and good to me here when she came to see me. I have full trust in her. Please have this done at once, and thank my friends for their kindnesses. I feel I am acting rightly, leaving this to my wife." Please write to Stuart Meadow in Paris, or Robert Sherard, to say how gratified I was at the performance of my play, and have my thanks conveyed to Lunia Poe. It is something that at a time of disgrace and shame I should be still regarded as an artist. I wish I could feel more pleasure, but I seem dead to all emotion except those of anguish and despair however please let lunia poe know that i am sensible of the honour he has done me he is a poet himself i fear you will find it difficult to read this but as i am not allowed writing materials i seem to have forgotten how to write you must excuse me thank moore for exerting himself for books for me unluckily i suffer from headaches when i read my greek and roman poets so they have not been of much use but his kindness was great in getting the set ask him to express my gratitude to the lady who lives at wimbledon write to me please in answer to this 
and tell me about literature, what new books, etc. Also Jones's play, and Forbes Robertson's management, about any new tendency in the stage of Paris or London. Also try and see what Lemaitre, Bauer, and Sarcy said of Salome, and give me a little resume. Please write to Henri and say I am touched at his writing nicely. Robert Sherard knows him. It was sweet of you to come and see me. You must come again next time. Here I have the horror of death with the still greater horror of living, and in silence and misery. I always remember you with deep affection. I wish Ernest would get from Oakley Street my portmanteau, fur coat, clothes, and the books of my own writing which I gave my dear mother. Ask, blank, in whose name the burial ground of my mother was taken. Always your friend, Oscar Wilde. End of section. To Robert Ross, Version 1, from the Catalogue of the Dalau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 7, from Reading, dated Saturday. Addressed to Dear Robbie. Two pages, quarto. I could not collect my thoughts yesterday, as I did not expect you till today. When you are good enough to come and see me, will you always fix the day? Anything sudden upsets me. Begs Ross to stop the dedication of a volume of poems to him. I could not accept or allow such a dedication. The proposal is revolting and grotesque. Asks Ross to collect certain letters of his and to seal them up. In case I die here... You will destroy them. In case I survive, I will destroy them myself. They must not be in existence. Even if I get out of this loathsome place, I know that there is nothing for me but a life of a pariah, of disgrace and penury and contempt. Let me know why Irving leaves Lyceum, etc., what he is playing, what at each theatre. Who did Stevenson criticise severely in his letters? Anything that will for an hour take my thoughts away from the one revolting subject of my imprisonment. I am deeply touched by the Lady of Wimbledon's kindness. You are very good to come and see me. Kind regards to Moore, whom I would so like to see. Signed, O. W. Discretion prevents fuller quotation of this letter, which is of the greatest interest. It has never been published. End of section. To Robert Ross, version 2, from the Birmingham Gazette, 18th of February, 1913. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Campbell next read the letter from Oscar Wilde to Mr. Robert Ross, which drew from Lord Alfred the foregoing in reply. In it occurred the following passages. He has in his possession a number of letters of mine. I hope he will hand them over to you. The thought that they are in his hands is horrible to me. Even if I get out of this ignoble place... There is nothing before me but penury, misery, and contempt. There followed an appeal for news of the literary and artistic world. Anything that will for an hour take my thoughts away from the one revolting idea of my imprisonment. Then Lord Alfred was referred to again. He has ruined my life. Let that content him. And there the letter closed. End of section. Lord Alfred Douglas to Robert Ross From the London Daily Herald, 18th of April, 1913 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Council read a letter which was a reply by Lord Alfred Douglas to one written by Oscar Wilde to Mr. Robert Ross, and sent on to Lord Alfred at Wilde's request. Letters Destroyed Reference was made to certain letters, and the writer, in refusing to give them up, said, The recollections of those letters, the memories they may give me, even if they give me no hope, will perhaps prevent me putting an end to a life which has now no raison d'etre. If Oscar asks me to kill myself, I will do so, but I could not give up the letters which are part of my life, the only part not poisoned and cankered. I will put them in a packet and seal them up. I know what Oscar says is true. I know I have ruined his life. The letter to which this was answer was then read. Wilde was writing from prison, and in his letter made a request that Mr. Ross should obtain his letters from Lord Alfred Douglas. The letter finished with the sentence, He has ruined my life. That should content him. The judge. What has become of the letters referred to? Lord Alfred Douglas. I have destroyed them. The hearing was adjourned. End of section. To Robert Ross. From De Profundis, 1907 Keller edition. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. H. M. Prison, Reading. To these purely business matters, perhaps more Aidy will kindly reply. His letter dealing purely with business, I shall be allowed to receive. It will not, I mean, interfere with your literary letter with regard to which the Governor has just now read me your kind message. For myself, my dear Robbie, I have little to say that can please you. The refusal to commute my sentence has been like a blow from a leaden sword. I am dazed with a dull sense of pain. I had fed on hope, and now anguish, grown hungry, feeds her fill on me as though she had been starved of her proper appetite. There are, however, kinder elements in this evil prison air than before. Sympathies have been shown to me, and I no longer feel entirely isolated from humane influences, which was before a source of terror and trouble to me. And I read Dante, and make excerpts and notes for the pleasure of using a pen and ink, and it seems as if I were better in many ways, and I am going to take up the study of German. Indeed, a prison seems to be the proper place for such a study. There is a thorn, however, as bitter as that of St. Paul, though different, that I must pluck out of my flesh in this letter. It is caused by a message you wrote on a piece of paper for me to see. I feel that if I kept it secret it might grow in my mind, as poisonous things grow in the dark, and take its place with other terrible thoughts that gnaw me. Thought? to those that sit alone and silent and in bonds, being no winged living thing, as Plato feigned it, but a thing dead, breeding what is horrible like a slime that shows monsters to the moon. I mean, of course, what you said about the sympathies of others being estranged from me, or in danger of being so, by the deep bitterness of my feelings, and I believe that my letter was lent and shown to others. Now, I don't like my letters shown about as curiosities. It is most distasteful to me. I write to you freely as to one of the dearest friends I have, or have ever had, and, with a few exceptions, the sympathy of others touches me, as far as its loss goes, very little. No man of my position can fall into the mire of life without getting a great deal of pity from his inferiors, and I know that when plays last too long, spectators tire. 
My tragedy has lasted far too long. Its climax is over. Its end is mean. And I am quite conscious of the fact that when the end does come, I shall return an unwelcome visitant to a world that does not want me. A revenant, as the French say, as one whose face is grey with long imprisonment and crooked with pain. Horrible as are the dead when they rise from their tombs, the living who come out of tombs are more horrible still. Of all this I am only too conscious. When one has been for eighteen terrible months in a prison cell, one sees things and people as they really are. The sight turns one to stone. Do not think that I would blame any one for my vices. My friends had as little to do with them as I had with theirs. Nature was in this matter a stepmother to all of us. I blame them for not appreciating the man they ruined. As long as my table was red with wine and roses, what did they care? My genius, my life was an artist, my work and the quiet I needed for it were nothing to them. I admit I lost my head. I was bewildered, incapable of judgment. I made the one fatal step, and now I sit here on a bench in a prison cell. In all tragedies there is a grotesque element. You know the grotesque element in mine. Do not think I do not blame myself. I curse myself night and day for my folly in allowing something to dominate my life. If there was an echo in these walls, it would cry, Fool, forever. I am utterly ashamed of my friendships, for by their friendships men can be judged. It is a test of every man, and I feel poignant abasement of shame for my friendships, of which you may read a full account in my trial. It is to me a daily source of mental humiliation. Of some of them I never think. They trouble me not. It is of no importance. Indeed, my entire tragedy seems to be grotesque and nothing else, for as a result of my having suffered myself to be thrown into a trap, and I sit in the lowest mire of Malbolge between Gilles de Retz and the Marquis de Sade, in certain places no one, except those actually insane, is allowed to laugh, and indeed, even in their case, it is against the regulations for conduct. Otherwise, I think I would laugh at that. For the rest, do not let anyone suppose that I am crediting others with unworthy motives. They really had no motives in life at all. Motives are intellectual things. They had passions merely, and such passions are false gods that will have victims at all costs, and in the present case have had one wreathed with bay. Now I have plucked the thorn out. That little scrawled line of yours rankled terribly. I now think merely of your getting quite well again, and writing at last the wonderful story of blank. Pray remember me to your dear mother, and also to Alec. The gilded sphinx is, I suppose, wonderful as ever and send from me all that in my thoughts and feelings is good, and whatever of remembrance and reverence she will accept, to the Lady of Wimbledon, whose soul is a sanctuary for those who are wounded, and a house of refuge for those in pain. Do not show this letter to others, nor discuss what I have written in your answer. Tell me about that world of shadows I loved so much, and about the life and the soul tell me also. I am curious of the things that stung me, and in my pain there is pity. Yours, Oscar. End of section. Robert Ross to Moore A.D.
from the Catalogue of the Delau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 50. Ross, Robert. An extremely important and interesting autograph letter signed, addressed to Moradi. Seven pages, quarto, closely written. Undated. Written while Wilde was in prison and describing a visit to him. The italics represent passages underlined in the original. Ten pounds. I went yesterday to Reading and met Sherard at Paddington. He seemed anxious that the third person in the railway carriage should know on what mission we were bent. After lunch we walked to the prison. A polite warder escorted us to the usual hutch and locked us in. We had to wait a considerable time. Then Oscar appeared. He is much thinner and is now clean-shaven, so that his emaciated condition is more apparent. His face is dull brick colour, I fancy from working in the sun in the garden. His eyes are horribly vacant. I noticed he had lost a great deal of hair. He always had great quantities of thick hair, but there is now a bald patch on the crown. It is also streaked with white and grey. The remarkable part of the interview was that Oscar hardly talked at all, except to ask if there was any chance of his being let out, what the attitude of the press and public would be, as to whether any of the present government would be favourably disposed towards him. He said he had nothing to say and wanted to hear us talk. That, as you know, is very unlike Oscar. He is not allowed pencil or paper. The chaplain is a nice, kind fellow, but he only sees him for a few minutes once a month. Perhaps he will write to me or to his wife, but wishes to hear from me. Asked, did we think his brain seem all right? Found Greek and Latin writers gave him a headache, could only read a little, had read everything else in library several times. When pressed by me several times to mention the sort of books he would like, he replied, Chaucer, prose translation of Dante, Pater's new book, of which I had spoken, and uh, some large volume of Elizabethan dramatist or dramatists, all this extracted with difficulty. Asked how he felt generally, he said in a half-aside, low voice, They treat me cruelly. I think he referred to his food. He added, as if for the benefit of the warder, I have only been in infirmary two days since I was at Reading. Asked if he had seen his wife lately, he said no, but believed she was coming soon. He seemed to take no interest in literary or artistic news that we told him, but seemed to talk to himself while we did so. He seemed so silent that there were several awkward pauses. I do not think they treat him badly. Of course, he does not get enough to eat for a person of his build, but I firmly and honestly believe, apart from all prejudice, that he is simply wasting and pining away. I believe that anyone who knew him at all in former days, and who visited him for an hour as a purely scientific subject, as the result of hard labour on certain constitutions, would arrive at the same conclusion. Of course, he would have to conceal from Oscar that his visit was actuated by anything save friendly interest, otherwise Oscar would hastily assume one of his hundred artificial manners, which he has for every person and every occasion, even when broken as he is now. Each person has his view as to what constitutes a decayed mind, but if I was asked about Oscar before a commission, I should say that confinement, apart from all labour or treatment, had made him temporarily silly. That is the mildest word that will describe my meaning. If asked whether he was going to die, it seems quite possible within the next few months, even if his constitution remained unimpaired. 
I should be less surprised to hear of dear Oscar's death than of Aubrey Beardsley's, and you know what he looks like. On coming into the courtyard of the prison, the very civil warder whispered to us that the two men in the middle were the governor and the doctor, respectively. I suddenly had to choose which I should approach. I decided to attack the governor, drew out a card, and sent the warder with a polite message requesting the favour of a few minutes' conversation. Isaacson is a Jew, tall, and not unlike the headmaster of a public school. He at first was haughty and impatient, but became quite polite and amiable after a few minutes. Of course I got nothing out of him, but he impressed me favourably. I told him I was anxious about Oscar's mental condition and general health. Isaacson replied that every man over forty was something of a doctor, and that he considered Oscar was doing as well as could be expected, that, naturally, Oscar felt the imprisonment more than another man who had not had his education and way of life, that if Oscar was ill, we should be told of it, that he would see the doctor every day if he liked, and every care was taken of him, etc. While we were talking, the doctor was snuffling and shuffling about, making impatient gestures. About thirty wretched convicts were scraping the walls of the courtyard and scrubbing the stone, and through an open door I saw the cause of the revolting stench that I noticed when I went to the prison, and it was worse on this occasion, great coils of tarred rope for making into oakum. Signed, Always yours devotedly, Robbie. End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas, De Profundis Expurgated, Part 1. From De Profundis, 1913, Methuen Edition. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Suffering is one very long moment. We cannot divide it by seasons. We can only record its moods and chronicle their return. With us, time itself does not progress. It revolves. It seems to circle round one centre of pain. The paralysing immobility of a life, every circumstance of which is regulated after an unchangeable pattern, so that we eat and drink and lie down and pray, or kneel at least for prayer, according to the inflexible laws of an iron formula, this immobile quality, that makes every dreadful day in the very minutest detail like its brother, seems to communicate itself to those external forces, the very essence of whose existence is ceaseless change, of seed-time or harvest, of the reapers bending over the corn, or the grape-gatherers threading through the vines, of the grass in the orchard made white with broken blossoms, or strewn with fallen fruit. Of these we know nothing, and can know nothing. For us there is only one season, the season of sorrow. The very sun and moon seem taken from us. Outside the day may be blue and gold, but the light that creeps down through the thickly muffled glass of the small iron-barred window beneath which one sits is grey and niggard. It is always twilight in one's cell, as it is always twilight in one's heart. And in the sphere of thought, no less than in the sphere of time, motion is no more. The thing that you personally have long ago forgotten, or can easily forget, is happening to me now, and will happen to me again to-morrow. Remember this, and you will be able to understand a little of why I am writing, and in this manner writing. A week later I am transferred here. Three more months go over, and my mother dies. No one knew how deeply I loved and honoured her. Her death was terrible to me, but I, once a lord of language, 
have no words in which to express my anguish and my shame she and my father had bequeathed me a name they had made noble and honoured not merely in literature art archaeology and science but in the public history of my own country in its evolution as a nation i had disgraced that name eternally i had made it a low byword among low people i had dragged it through the very mire i had given it to brutes that they might make it brutal and to fools that they might turn it into a synonym for folly what i suffered then and still suffer is not for pen to write or paper to record my wife always kind and gentle to me rather than that i should hear the news from indifferent lips travelled ill as she was all the way from genoa to england to break to me herself the tidings of so irreparable so irremediable a loss messages of sympathy reached me from all who had still affection for me even people who had not known me personally hearing that a new sorrow had broken into my life wrote to ask that some expression of their condolence should be conveyed to me three months go over the calendar of my daily conduct and labour that hangs on the outside of my cell door with my name and sentence written upon it tells me that it is may prosperity pleasure and success may be rough of grain and common in fibre but sorrow is the most sensitive of all created things there is nothing that stirs in the whole world of thought to which sorrow does not vibrate in terrible and exquisite pulsation the thin beaten-out leaf of tremulous gold that chronicles the direction of forces the eye cannot see is in comparison coarse it is a wound that bleeds when any hand but that of love touches it and even then must bleed again though not in pain where there is sorrow there is holy ground some day people will realize what that means they will know nothing of life till they do and natures like his can realize it when i was brought down from my prison to the court of bankruptcy between two policemen waited in the long dreary corridor that before the whole crowd whom an action so sweet and simple hushed into silence he might gravely raise his hat to me as handcuffed and with bowed head i passed him by men have gone to heaven for smaller things than that it was in this spirit and with this mode of love that the saints knelt down to wash the feet of the poor or stooped to kiss the leper on the cheek i have never said one single word to him about what he did i do not know to the present moment whether he is aware that i was even conscious of his action it is not a thing for which one can render formal thanks in formal words i store it in the treasure-house of my heart i keep it there as a secret debt that i am glad to think i can never possibly repay it is embalmed and kept sweet by the myrrh and cassia of many tears when wisdom has been profitless to me philosophy barren and the proverbs and phrases of those who have sought to give me consolation as dust and ashes in my mouth the memory of that little lovely silent act of love has unsealed for me all the wells of pity made the desert blossom like a rose and brought me out of the bitterness of lonely exile into harmony with the wounded broken and great heart of the world when people are able to understand not merely how beautiful blank's action was but why it meant so much to me and always will mean so much then perhaps they will realize how and in what spirit they should approach me the poor are wise more charitable more kind more sensitive than we are 
in their eyes a prison is a tragedy in a man's life a misfortune a casualty something that calls for sympathy in others they speak of one who is in prison as of one who is in trouble simply it is the phrase they always use and the expression has the perfect wisdom of love in it with people of our rank it is different with us prison makes a man a pariah i and such as i am have hardly any right to air and sun our presence taints the pleasures of others we are unwelcome when we reappear to revisit the glimpses of the moon is not for us our very children are taken away those lovely links with humanity are broken we are doomed to be solitary while our sons still live we are denied the one thing that might heal us and keep us that might bring balm to the bruised heart and peace to the soul in pain i must say to myself that i ruined myself and that nobody great or small can be ruined except by his own hand i am quite ready to say so i am trying to say so though they may not think it at the present moment this pitiless indictment i bring without pity against myself terrible as was what the world did to me what i did to myself was far more terrible still i was a man who stood in symbolic relations to the art and culture of my age i had realised this for myself at the very dawn of my manhood and had forced my age to realise it afterwards few men hold such a position in their own lifetime and have it so acknowledged it is usually discerned if discerned at all by the historian or the critic long after both the man and his age have passed away with me it was different i felt it myself and made others feel it byron was a symbolic figure but his relations were to the passion of his age and its weariness of passion mine were to something more noble more permanent of more vital issue of larger scope the gods had given me almost everything but i let myself be lured into long spells of senseless and sensual ease i amused myself with being a flaneur a dandy a man of fashion i surrounded myself with the smaller natures and the meaner minds i became the spendthrift of my own genius and to waste an eternal youth gave me a curious joy tired of being on the heights i deliberately went to the depths in the search for new sensation what the paradox was to me in the sphere of thought perversity became to me in the sphere of passion desire at the end was a malady or a madness or both i grew careless of the lives of others i took pleasure where it pleased me and passed on i forgot that every little action of the common day makes or unmakes character and that therefore what one has done in the secret chamber one has some day to cry aloud on the housetop i ceased to be lord over myself i was no longer the captain of my soul and did not know it i allowed pleasure to dominate me i ended in horrible disgrace there is only one thing for me now absolute humility i have lain in prison for nearly two years out of my nature has come wild despair an abandonment to grief that was piteous even to look at terrible and impotent rage bitterness and scorn anguish that wept aloud misery that could find no voice sorrow that was dumb i have passed through every possible mood of suffering better than wordsworth himself i know what wordsworth meant when he said suffering is permanent obscure and dark and has the nature of infinity 
but while there were times when i rejoiced in the idea that my sufferings were to be endless i could not bear them to be without meaning now i find hidden somewhere away in my nature something that tells me that nothing in the whole world is meaningless and suffering least of all that something hidden away in my nature like a treasure in a field is humility it is the last thing left in me and the best the ultimate discovery at which i have arrived the starting point for a fresh development it has come to me right out of myself so i know that it has come at the proper time it could not have come before nor later had any one told me of it i would have rejected it had it been brought to me i would have refused it as i found it i want to keep it i must do so it is the one thing that has in it the elements of life of a new life vita nuova for me of all things it is the strangest one cannot acquire it except by surrendering everything that one has it is only when one has lost all things that one knows that one possesses it now i have realized that it is in me i see quite clearly what i ought to do in fact must do and when i use such a phrase as that i need not say that i am not alluding to any external sanction or command i admit none i am far more of an individualist than i ever was nothing seems to me of the smallest value except what one gets out of oneself my nature is seeking a fresh mode of self-realization that is all i am concerned with and the first thing that i have got to do is to free myself from any possible bitterness of feeling against the world i am completely penniless and absolutely homeless yet there are worse things in the world than that i am quite candid when i say that rather than go out from this prison with bitterness in my heart against the world i would gladly and readily beg my bread from door to door if i got nothing from the house of the rich i would get something at the house of the poor those who have much are often greedy those who have little always share i would not a bit mind sleeping in the cool grass in summer and when winter came on sheltering myself by the warm close thatched rick or under the penthouse of a great barn provided i had love in my heart the external things of life seem to me now of no importance at all you can see to what intensity of individualism i have arrived or am arriving rather for the journey is long and where i walk there are thorns of course i know that to ask alms on the highway is not to be my lot and that if ever i lie in the cool grass at night-time it will be to write sonnets to the moon when i go out of prison r blank, will be waiting for me on the other side of the big iron-studded gate and he is the symbol not merely of his own affection but of the affection of many others besides i believe i am to have enough to live on for about eighteen months at any rate so that if i may not write beautiful books i may at least read beautiful books and what joy can be greater after that i hope to be able to recreate my creative faculty but were things different had i not a friend left in the world were there not a single house open to me in pity had i to accept the wallet and ragged cloak of sheer penury as long as i am free from all resentment hardness and scorn i would be able to face the life with much more calm and confidence than i would were my body in purple and fine linen and the soul within me sick with hate and i really shall have no difficulty when you really want love you will find it waiting for you 
i need not say that my task does not end there it would be comparatively easy if it did there is much more before me i have hills far steeper to climb valleys much darker to pass through and i have to get it all out of myself neither religion morality nor reason can help me at all morality does not help me i am a born antinomian i am one of those who are made for exceptions not for laws but while i see that there is nothing wrong in what one does i see that there is something wrong in what one becomes it is well to have learned that religion does not help me the faith that others give to what is unseen i give to what one can touch and look at my gods dwell in temples made with hands and within the circle of actual experience is my creed made perfect and complete too complete it may be for like many or all of those who have placed their heaven in this earth i have found in it not merely the beauty of heaven but the horror of hell also when i think about religion at all i feel as if i would like to found an order for those who cannot believe the confraternity of the faithless one might call it where on an altar on which no taper burned a priest in whose heart peace had no dwelling might celebrate with unblessed bread and a chalice empty of wine everything to be true must become a religion and agnosticism should have its ritual no less than faith it has sown its martyrs it should reap its saints and praise god daily for having hidden himself from man but whether it be faith or agnosticism it must be nothing external to me its symbols must be of my own creating only that is spiritual which makes its own form if i may not find its secret within myself i shall never find it if i have not got it already it will never come to me reason does not help me it tells me that the laws under which i am convicted are wrong and unjust laws and the system under which i have suffered a wrong and unjust system but somehow i have got to make both of these things just and right to me and exactly as in art one is only concerned with what a particular thing is at a particular moment to oneself so it is also in the ethical evolution of one's character i have got to make everything that has happened to me good for me the plank bed the loathsome food the hard ropes shredded into oakum till one's fingertips grow dull with pain the menial offices with which each day begins and finishes the harsh orders that routine seems to necessitate the dreadful dress that makes sorrow grotesque to look at the silence the solitude the shame each and all of these things i have to transform into a spiritual experience there is not a single degradation of the body which i must not try and make into a spiritualizing of the soul i want to get to the point where i shall be able to say quite simply and without affectation that the two great turning points in my life were when my father sent me to oxford and when society sent me to prison i will not say that prison is the best thing that could have happened to me for that phrase would savour of too great bitterness towards myself i would sooner say or hear it said of me that i was so typical a child of my age that in my perversity and for that perversity's sake i turned the good things of my life to evil and the evil things of my life to good what is said however by myself or by others matters little the important thing the thing that lies before me the thing that i have to do if the brief remainder of my days is not to be maimed marred and incomplete is to absorb into my nature all that has been done to me to make it part of me 
to accept it without complaint, fear, or reluctance. The supreme vice is shallowness. Whatever is realised is right. When first I was put into prison, some people advised me to try and forget who I was. It was ruinous advice. It is only by realising what I am that I have found comfort of any kind. Now I am advised by others to try on my release to forget that I have ever been in a prison at all. I know that would be equally fatal. It would mean that I would always be haunted by an intolerable sense of disgrace, and that those things that are meant for me as much as for anybody else, the beauty of the sun and moon, the pageant of the seasons, the music of daybreak and the silence of great nights, the rain falling through the leaves, or the dew creeping over the grass and making it silver, would all be tainted for me, and lose their healing power, and their power of communicating joy. To regret one's own experiences is to arrest one's own development. To deny one's own experiences is to put a lie into the lips of one's own life. It is no less than a denial of the soul. For just as the body absorbs things of all kinds, things common and unclean no less than those that the priest or a vision has cleansed, and converts them into swiftness or strength, into the play of beautiful muscles and the moulding of fair flesh, into the curves and colours of the hair, the lips, the eye. So the soul, in its turn, has its nutritive functions also, and can transform into noble moods of thought and passions of high import what in itself is base, cruel, and degrading. Nay, more, may find in these its most august modes of assertion, and can often reveal itself most perfectly through what was intended to desecrate or destroy. The fact of my having been the common prisoner of a common jail I must frankly accept, and, curious as it may seem, one of the things I shall have to teach myself is not to be ashamed of it. I must accept it as a punishment, and if one is ashamed of having been punished, one might just as well never have been punished at all. Of course, there are many things of which I was convicted that I had not done, but then there are many things of which I was convicted that I had done, and a still greater number of things in my life for which I was never indicted at all. And as the gods are strange, and punish us for what is good and humane in us, as much as for what is evil and perverse, I must accept the fact that one is punished for the good as well as for the evil that one does. I have no doubt that it is quite right one should be. It helps one, or should help one, to realise both, and not to be too conceited about either. And if I then am not too ashamed of my punishment, as I hope not to be, I shall be able to think, and walk, and live with freedom. Many men on their release carry their prison about them into the air, and hide it as a secret disgrace in their hearts, and at length, like poor poisoned things, creep into some hole and die. It is wretched that they should have to do so, and it is wrong, terribly wrong, of society that it should force them to do so. Society takes upon itself the right to inflict appalling punishment on the individual, but it also has the supreme vice of shallowness, and fails to realise what it has done. When the man's punishment is over, it leaves him to himself. That is to say, it abandons him at the very moment when its highest duty towards him begins. It is really ashamed of its own actions, and shuns those whom it has punished, as people shun a creditor whose debt they cannot pay, or one on whom they have inflicted an irreparable and irremediable wrong. I can claim on my side that if I realise what I have suffered, 
society should realise what it has inflicted on me, and that there should be no bitterness or hate on either side. Of course, I know that from one point of view, things will be made different for me than for others, must, indeed, by the very nature of the case, be made so. The poor thieves and outcasts who are imprisoned here with me are in many respects more fortunate than I am. The little way in grey city or green field that saw their sin is small. To find those who know nothing of what they have done, they need go no further than a bird might fly between the twilight and the dawn. But for me the world is shriveled to a hand's breadth, and everywhere I turn my name is written on the rocks in lead. For I have come, not from obscurity into the momentary notoriety of crime, but from a sort of eternity of fame to a sort of eternity of infamy, and sometimes seem to myself to have shown, if indeed it required showing, that between the famous and the infamous there is but one step, if as much as one. Still, in the very fact that people will recognise me wherever I go, and know all about my life, as far as its follies go, I can discern something good for me. It will force on me the necessity of again asserting myself as an artist, and as soon as I possibly can. If I can produce only one beautiful work of art, I shall be able to rob malice of its venom, and cowardice of its sneer, and to pluck out the tongue of scorn by the roots. And if life be, as it surely is, a problem to me, I am no less a problem to life. People must adopt some attitude towards me, and so pass judgment both on themselves and me. I need not say I am not talking of particular individuals, the only people I would care to be with now are artists, and people who have suffered. Those who know what beauty is, and those who know what sorrow is. Nobody else interests me. Nor am I making any demands on life. In all that I have said, I am simply concerned with my own mental attitude towards life as a whole, and I feel that not to be ashamed of having been punished is one of the first points I must attain to, for the sake of my own perfection, and because I am so imperfect. Then I must learn how to be happy. Once I knew it, or thought I knew it, by instinct. It was always springtime once in my heart. My temperament was akin to joy, I filled my life to the very brim with pleasure, as one might fill a cup to the very brim with wine. Now I am approaching life from a completely new standpoint, and even to conceive happiness is often extremely difficult for me. I remember during my first term at Oxford reading in Pater's Renaissance, that book which has had such strange influence over my life, how Dante places low in the inferno those who willfully live in sadness, and going to the college library and turning to the passage in the Divine Comedy where beneath the dreary marsh lie those who were sullen in the sweet air, saying for ever and ever through their sighs, Tristi fumo nel aer dolce che dal sol s'allegra. I knew the church condemned at Chidia, but the whole idea seemed to me quite fantastic, just the sort of sin, I fancied, a priest who knew nothing about real life would invent. Nor could I understand how Dante, who says that sorrow remarries us to God, could have been so harsh to those who were enamoured of melancholy, if any such there really were. I had no idea that, some day, this would become to me one of the greatest temptations of my life. End of section To Lord Alfred Douglas, De Profundis, Expurgated, 
Part 2 From De Profundis, 1913, Methuen Edition This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. While I was in Wandsworth Prison, I longed to die. It was my one desire. When, after two months in the infirmary, I was transferred here, and found myself growing gradually better in physical health, I was filled with rage. I determined to commit suicide on the very day on which I left prison. After a time that evil mood passed away, and I made up my mind to live, but to wear gloom as a king wears purple, never to smile again, to turn whatever house I entered into a house of mourning, to make my friends walk slowly in sadness with me, to teach them that melancholy is the true secret of life, to maim them with an alien sorrow, to mar them with my own pain. Now I feel quite differently. I see it would be both ungrateful and unkind of me to pull so long a face that when my friends came to see me they would have to make their faces still longer in order to show their sympathy or, if I desired to entertain them, to invite them to sit down silently to bitter herbs and funeral-baked meats. I must learn how to be cheerful and happy. The last two occasions on which I was allowed to see my friends here, I tried to be as cheerful as possible, and to show my cheerfulness, in order to make them some slight return for their trouble in coming all the way from town to see me. It is only a slight return, I know, but it is the one, I feel certain, that pleases them most. I saw R. Blank, for an hour on Saturday week, and I tried to give the fullest possible expression of the delight I really felt at our meeting, and that... In the views and ideas I am here shaping for myself, I am quite right, is shown to me by the fact that now, for the first time since my imprisonment, I have a real desire for life. There is before me so much to do, that I would regard it as a terrible tragedy if I died before I was allowed to complete, at any rate, a little of it. I see new developments in art and life, each one of which is a fresh mode of perfection. I long to live so that I can explore what is no less than a new world to me. Do you want to know what this new world is? I think you can guess what it is. It is the world in which I have been living. Sorrow, then, and all that it teaches one, is my new world. I used to live entirely for pleasure, I shunned suffering and sorrow of every kind. I hated both. I resolved to ignore them as far as possible, to treat them, that is to say, as modes of imperfection. They were not part of my scheme of life. They had no place in my philosophy. My mother, who knew life as a whole, used often to quote to me Goethe's lines, written by Carlyle in a book he had given her years ago, and translated by him, I fancy, also, who never ate his bread in sorrow, who never spent the midnight hours weeping and waiting for the morrow, he knows you not, ye heavenly powers. They were the lines which that noble queen of Prussia, whom Napoleon treated with such coarse brutality, used to quote in her humiliation and exile. They were the lines my mother often quoted in the troubles of her later life. I absolutely declined to accept or admit the enormous truth hidden in them. I could not understand it. I remember quite well how I used to tell her that I did not want to eat my bread in sorrow, or to pass any night weeping and watching for a more bitter dawn. I had no idea that it was one of the special things that the fates had in store for me, that for a whole year of my life, indeed, I was to do little else. But so has my portion been meted out to me, and during the last few months I have, 
after terrible difficulties and struggles, been able to comprehend some of the lessons hidden in the heart of pain. Clergymen and people who use phrases without wisdom sometimes talk of suffering as a mystery. It is really a revelation. One discerns things one never discerned before. One approaches the whole of history from a different standpoint. What one had felt dimly, through instinct, about art, is intellectually and emotionally realised with perfect clearness of vision and absolute intensity of apprehension. I now see that sorrow, being the supreme emotion of which man is capable, is at once the type and test of all great art. What the artist is always looking for is the mode of existence in which soul and body are one and indivisible, in which the outward is expressive of the inward, in which form reveals. Of such modes of existence there are not a few. Youth and the arts, preoccupied with youth, may serve as a model for us at one moment. At another we may like to think that, in its subtlety and sensitiveness of impression, its suggestion of a spirit dwelling in external things and making its raiment of earth and air, of mist and city alike, and in its morbid sympathy of its moods and tones and colours, modern landscape art is realising for us pictorially what was realised in such plastic perfection by the Greeks. Music, in which all subject is absorbed in expression and cannot be separated from it, is a complex example, and a flower or a child a simple example of what I mean. But sorrow is the ultimate type, both in life and art. Behind joy and laughter there may be a temperament, coarse, hard and callous, but behind sorrow there is always sorrow. Pain, unlike pleasure, wears no mask. Truth in art is not any correspondence between the essential idea and the accidental existence. It is not the resemblance of shape to shadow, or of the form mirrored in the crystal to the form itself. It is no echo coming from a hollow hill, any more than it is a silver well of water in the valley that shows the moon to the moon and Narcissus to Narcissus. Truth in art is the unity of a thing with itself, the outward rendered expressive of the inward, the soul made incarnate, the body instinct with spirit. For this reason there is no truth comparable to sorrow, there are times when sorrow seems to me to be the only truth. Other things may be illusions of the eye or the appetite, made to blind the one and cloy the other. But out of sorrow have the worlds been built, and at the birth of a child or a star there is pain. More than this, there is about sorrow an intense, an extraordinary reality. I have said of myself that I was one who stood in symbolic relations to the art and culture of my age. There is not a single wretched man in this wretched place along with me who does not stand in symbolic relation to the very secret of life, for the secret of life is suffering. It is what is hidden behind everything. When we begin to live, what is sweet is so sweet to us and what is bitter so bitter, that we inevitably direct all our desires towards pleasures, and seek not merely for a month or twain to feed on honeycomb, but for all our years to taste no other food, ignorant all the while that we may really be starving the soul. I remember talking once on this subject to one of the most beautiful personalities I have ever known, a woman whose sympathy and noble kindness to me, both before and since the tragedy of my imprisonment, have been beyond power and description. One who has really assisted me, although she does not know it, 
to bear the burden of my troubles more than any one else in the whole world has and all through the mere fact of her existence through her being what she is partly an ideal and partly an influence a suggestion of what one might become as well as a real help towards becoming it a soul that renders the common air sweet and makes what is spiritual seem as simple and natural as sunlight or the sea one for whom beauty and sorrow walk hand in hand and have the same message on the occasion of which i am thinking i recall distinctly how i said to her that there was enough suffering in one narrow london lane to show that god did not love man and that wherever there was any sorrow though but that of a child in some little garden weeping over a fault that it had or had not committed the whole face of creation was completely marred i was entirely wrong she told me so but i could not believe her i was not in the sphere in which such belief was to be attained to now it seems to me that love of some kind is the only possible explanation of the extraordinary amount of suffering that there is in the world i cannot conceive of any other explanation i am convinced that there is no other and that if the world has indeed as i have said been built of sorrow it has been built by the hands of love because in no other way could the soul of man for whom the world was made reach the full stature of its perfection pleasure for the beautiful body but pain for the beautiful soul when i say that i am convinced of these things i speak with too much pride far off like a perfect pearl one can see the city of god it is so wonderful that it seems as if a child could reach it in a summer's day and so a child could but with me and such as me it is different one can realize a thing in a single moment but one loses it in the long hours that follow with leaden feet it is so difficult to keep heights that the soul is competent to gain we think in eternity but we move slowly through time and how slowly time goes with us who lie in prison i need not tell again nor of the weariness and despair that creep back into one's cell and into the cell of one's heart with such strange insistence that one has as it were to garnish and sweep one's house for their coming as for an unwelcome guest or a bitter master or a slave whose slave it is one's chance or choice to be and though at present my friends may find it a hard thing to believe it is true none the less that for them living in freedom and idleness and comfort it is more easy to learn the lessons of humility than it is for me who begin the day by going down on my knees and washing the floor of my cell for prison life with its endless privations and restrictions makes one rebellious the most terrible thing about it is not that it breaks one's heart hearts are made to be broken but that it turns one's heart to stone one sometimes feels that it is only with a front of brass and a lip of scorn that one can get through the day at all and he who is in a state of rebellion cannot receive grace to use the phrase of which the church is so fond so rightly fond i dare say for in life as in art the mood of rebellion closes up the channels of the soul and shuts out the airs of heaven yet i must learn these lessons here if i am to learn them anywhere and must be filled with joy if my feet are on the right road and my face set towards the gate which is called beautiful though i may fall many times in the mire and often in the mist go astray this new life as through my love of dante i like sometimes to call it is of course no new life at all but simply the continuance by means of development and evolution of my former life 
i remember when i was at oxford saying to one of my friends as we were strolling round maudlin's narrow bird-haunted walks one morning in the year before i took my degree that i wanted to eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden of the world and that i was going out into the world with that passion in my soul and so indeed i went out and so i lived my only mistake was that i confined myself so exclusively to the trees of what seemed to me the sunlit side of the garden and shunned the other side for its shadow and its gloom failure disgrace poverty sorrow despair suffering tears even the broken words that come from lips in pain remorse that makes one walk on thorns conscience that condemns self-abasement that punishes the misery that puts ashes on its head the anguish that chooses sackcloth for its raiment and into its own drink puts gall all these were things of which i was afraid and as i had determined to know nothing of them i was forced to taste each of them in turn to feed on them to have for a season indeed no other food at all i don't regret for a single moment having lived for pleasure i did it to the full as one should do everything that one does there was no pleasure i did not experience i threw the pearl of my soul into a cup of wine i went down the primrose path to the sound of flutes i lived on honeycomb but to have continued the same life would have been wrong because it would have been limiting i had to pass on the other half of the garden had its secrets for me also of course all this is foreshadowed and prefigured in my books some of it is in the happy prince some of it in the young king notably in the passage where the bishop says to the kneeling boy is not he who made misery wiser than thou art a phrase which when i wrote it seemed to me little more than a phrase a great deal of it is hidden away in the note of doom that like a purple thread runs through the texture of dorian gray in the critic as artist it is set forth in many colours in the soul of man it is written down and in letters too easy to read it is one of the refrains whose recurring motifs makes salome so like a piece of music and bind it together as a ballad in the prose poem of the man who from the bronze of the image of the pleasure that liveth for a moment has to make the image of the sorrow that abideth for ever it is incarnate it could not have been otherwise at every single moment of one's life one is what one is going to be no less than what one has been art is a symbol because man is a symbol it is if i can fully attain to it the ultimate realization of the artistic life for the artistic life is simply self-development humility in the artist is his frank acceptance of all experiences just as love in the artist is simply the sense of beauty that reveals to the world its body and its soul in marius the epicurean pater seeks to reconcile the artistic life with a life of religion in the deep sweet and austere sense of the word but marius is little more than a spectator an ideal spectator indeed and one to whom it is given to contemplate the spectacle of life with appropriate emotions which wordsworth defines as the poet's true aim yet a spectator merely and perhaps a little too much occupied with the comeliness of the benches of the sanctuary to notice that it is the sanctuary of sorrow that he is gazing at i see a far more intimate and immediate connection between the true life of christ and the true life of the artist and i take a keen pleasure in the reflection that long before sorrow had made my days her own and bound me to her wheel i had written in the soul of man 
that he who would lead a christ-like life must be entirely and absolutely himself and had taken as my types not merely the shepherd on the hillside and the prisoner in his cell but also the painter to whom the world is a pageant and the poet for whom the world is a song i remember saying once to andre gide as we sat together in some paris cafe that while metaphysics had but little real interest for me and morality absolutely none there was nothing that either plato or christ had said that could not be transferred immediately into the sphere of art and there find its complete fulfilment nor is it merely that we can discern in christ that close union of personality with perfection which forms the real distinction between the classical and romantic movement in life but the very basis of his nature was the same as that of the nature of the artist an intense and flame-like imagination he realized in the entire sphere of human relations that imaginative sympathy which in the sphere of art is the sole secret of creation he understood the leprosy of the leper the darkness of the blind the fierce misery of those who live for pleasure the strange poverty of the rich some one wrote to me in trouble when you were not on your pedestal you were not interesting how remote was the writer from what matthew arnold calls the secret of jesus either would have taught him that whatever happens to another happens to oneself and if you want an inscription to read at dawn and at night-time and for pleasure or for pain write up on the walls of your house in letters for the sun to gild and the moon to silver whatever happens to oneself happens to another christ's place indeed is with the poets his whole conception of humanity sprang right out of the imagination and can only be realized by it what god was to the pantheist man was to him he was the first to conceive the divided races as a unity before his time there had been gods and men and feeling through the mysticism of sympathy that in himself each had been made incarnate he calls himself the son of the one or the son of the other according to his mood more than any one else in history he wakes in us that temper of wonder to which romance always appeals there is still something to me almost incredible in the idea of a young galilean peasant imagining that he could bear on his own shoulders the burden of the entire world all that had already been done and suffered and all that was yet to be done and suffered the sins of nero of caesar borgia of alexander the sixth and of him who was emperor of rome and priest of the sun the sufferings of those whose names are legion and whose dwelling is among the tombs oppressed nationalities factory children thieves people in prison outcasts those who are dumb under oppression and whose silence is heard only of god and not merely imagining this but actually achieving it so that at the present moment all who come in contact with his personality even though they may neither bow to his altar nor kneel before his priest in some way find that the ugliness of their sin is taken away and the beauty of their sorrow revealed to them i have said of christ that he ranks with the poets that is true shelley and sophocles are of his company but his entire life also is the most wonderful of poems for pity and terror there is nothing in the entire cycle of greek tragedy to touch it the absolute purity of the protagonist raises the entire scheme to a height of romantic art from which the suffering of thebes and pelops line are by their very horror excluded and shows how wrong aristotle was when he said in his treatise on the drama 
that it would be impossible to bear the spectacle of one blameless in pain nor in aeschylus nor dante those stern masters of tenderness in shakespeare the most purely human of all the great artists in the whole of celtic myth and legend where the loveliness of the world is shown through a mist of tears and the life of a man is no more than the life of a flower is there anything that for sheer simplicity of pathos wedded and made one with sublimity of tragic effect can be said to equal or even approach the last act of christ's passion the little supper with his companions one of whom has already sold him for a price the anguish in the quiet moonlit garden the false friend coming close to him so as to betray him with a kiss the friend who still believed in him and on whom as on a rock he had hoped to build a house of refuge for man denying him as the bird cried to the dawn his own utter loneliness his submission his acceptance of everything and along with it all such scenes as the high priest of orthodoxy rending his raiment in wrath and the magistrate of civil justice calling for water in the vain hope of cleansing himself of that stain of innocent blood that makes him the scarlet figure of history the coronation ceremony of sorrow one of the most wonderful things in the whole of recorded time the crucifixion of the innocent one before the eyes of his mother and of the disciple whom he loved the soldiers gambling and throwing dice for his clothes the terrible death by which he gave the world its most eternal symbol and his final burial in the tomb of the rich man his body swathed in egyptian linen with costly spices and perfumes as though he had been a king's son when one contemplates all this from the point of view of art alone one cannot but be grateful that the supreme office of the church should be the playing of the tragedy without the shedding of blood the mystical presentation by means of dialogue and costume and gesture even of the passion of her lord and it is always a source of pleasure and awe to me to remember that the ultimate survival of the greek chorus lost elsewhere to art is to be found in the servitor answering the priest at mass end of section to lord alfred douglas de profundis expurgated part three from de profundis 1913 methuen edition this librivox recording is in the public domain yet the whole life of christ so entirely may sorrow and beauty be made one in their meaning and manifestation is really an idyll though it ends with the veil of the temple being rent and the darkness coming over the face of the earth and the stone rolled to the door of the sepulchre one always thinks of him as a young bridegroom with his companions as indeed he somewhere describes himself as a shepherd straying through a valley with his sheep in search of green meadow or cool stream as a singer trying to build out of the music the walls of the city of god or as a lover for whose love the whole world was too small his miracles seem to me to be as exquisite as the coming of spring and quite as natural i see no difficulty at all in believing that such was the charm of his personality that his mere presence could bring peace to souls in anguish and that those who touched his garments or his hands forgot their pain or that as he passed by on the highway of life people who had seen nothing of life's mystery saw it clearly and others who had been deaf to every voice but that of pleasure heard for the first time the voice of love and found it as musical as apollo's lute or that evil passions fled at his approach and men whose dull unimaginative lives had been but a mode of death 
rose as if it were from the grave when he called them or that when he taught on the hillside the multitude forgot their hunger and thirst and the cares of this world and that to his friends who listened to him as he sat at meat the coarse food seemed delicate and the water had the taste of good wine and the whole house became full of the odour and sweetness of nard renan in his vie de jesus that gracious fifth gospel the gospel according to st thomas one might call it says somewhere that christ's great achievement was that he made himself as much loved after his death as he had been during his lifetime and certainly if his place is among the poets he is the leader of all the lovers he saw that love was the first secret of the world for which the wise men had been looking and that it was only through love that one could approach either the heart of the leper or the feet of god and above all christ is the most supreme of individualists humility like the artistic acceptance of all experiences is merely a mode of manifestation it is man's soul that christ is always looking for he calls it god's kingdom and finds it in every one he compares it to little things to a tiny seed to a handful of leaven to a pearl that is because one realises one's soul only by getting rid of all alien passions all acquired culture and all external possessions be they good or evil i bore up against everything with some stubbornness of will and much rebellion of nature till i had absolutely nothing left in the world but one thing i had lost my name my position my happiness my freedom my wealth i was a prisoner and a pauper but i still had my children left suddenly they were taken away from me by the law it was a blow so appalling that i did not know what to do so i flung myself on my knees and bowed my head and wept and said the body of a child is as the body of the lord i am not worthy of either that moment seemed to save me i saw then that the only thing for me was to accept everything since then curious as it will no doubt sound i have been happier it was of course my soul in its ultimate essence that i had reached in many ways i had been its enemy but i found it waiting for me as a friend when one comes into contact with the soul it makes one simple as a child as christ said one should be it is tragic how few people ever possess their souls before they die nothing is more rare in any man says emerson than an act of his own it is quite true most people are other people their thoughts are someone else's opinions their lives a mimicry their passions a quotation christ was not merely the supreme individualist but he was the first individualist in history people have tried to make him out an ordinary philanthropist or ranked him as an altruist with the scientific and sentimental but he was really neither one nor the other pity he has of course for the poor for those who are shut up in prisons for the lowly for the wretched but he has far more pity for the rich for the hard hedonists for those who waste their freedom in becoming slaves to things for those who wear soft raiment and live in kings houses riches and pleasure seemed to him to be really greater tragedies than poverty or sorrow and as for altruism who knew better than he that it is vocation not volition that determines us and that one cannot gather grapes of thorns or figs from thistles to live for others as a definite self-conscious aim was not his creed it was not the basis of his creed 
when he says forgive your enemies it is not for the sake of the enemy but for one's own sake that he says so and because love is more beautiful than hate in his own entreaty to the young man sell all that thou hast and give to the poor it is not of the state of the poor that he is thinking but of the state of the young man the soul that wealth was marring in his view of life he is one with the artist who knows that by the inevitable lord of self-perfection the poet must sing and the sculptor think in bronze and the painter make the world a mirror for his moods as surely and as certainly as the hawthorn must blossom in spring and the corn turn to gold at harvest time and the moon in her ordered wanderings change from shield to sickle and from sickle to shield but while christ did not say to men live for others he pointed out that there was no difference at all between the lives of others and one's own life by this means he gave to man an extended a titan personality since his coming the history of each separate individual is or can be made the history of the world of course culture has intensified the personality of man art has made us myriad minded those who have the artistic temperament go into exile with dante and learn how salt is the bread of others and how steep their stairs they catch for a moment the serenity and calm of goethe and yet know but too well that baudelaire cried to god o oh, signor donnez moi la force et la courage de contempler mon corps et mon coeur sans dégoût out of shakespeare's sonnets they draw to their own hurt it may be the secret of his love and make it their own they look with new eyes on modern life because they have listened to one of chopin's nocturnes or handled greek things or read the story of the passion of some dead man for some dead woman whose hair was like threads of fine gold and whose mouth was as a pomegranate but the sympathy of the artistic temperament is necessarily with what has found expression in words or in colours in music or in marble behind the painted masks of an aeschylean play or through some sicilian shepherd's pierced and jointed reeds the man and his message must have been revealed to the artist expression is the only mode under which he can conceive life at all to him what is dumb is dead but to christ it was not so with a width and wonder of imagination that fills one almost with awe he took the entire world of the inarticulate the voiceless world of pain as his kingdom and made of himself its eternal mouthpiece those of whom i have spoken who are dumb under oppression and whose silence is heard only of god he chose as his brothers he sought to become eyes to the blind ears to the deaf and a cry in the lips of those whose tongues had been tied his desire was to be to the myriads who had found no utterance a very trumpet through which they might call to heaven and feeling with the artistic nature of one to whom suffering and sorrow were modes through which he could realise his conception of the beautiful that an idea is of no value till it becomes incarnate and is made an image he made of himself the image of the man of sorrows and as such has fascinated and dominated art as no greek god ever succeeded in doing for the greek gods in spite of the white and red of their fair fleet limbs were not really what they appeared to be the curved brow of apollo was like the sun's disk crescent over the hill at dawn and his feet were as the wings of the morning but he himself had been cruel to marcius and had made niobe childless 
in the steel shields of athena's eyes there had been no pity for arachne the pomp and peacocks of hera were all that was really noble about her and the father of the gods himself had been too fond of the daughters of men the two most deeply suggestive figures of greek mythology were for religion demeter an earth goddess not one of the olympians and for art dionysus the son of a mortal woman to whom the moment of his birth had proved also the moment of her death but life itself from its lowliest and most humble sphere produced one far more marvellous than the mother of proserpina or the son of semele out of the carpenter's shop at nazareth had come a personality infinitely greater than any made by myth and legend and one strangely enough destined to reveal to the world the mystical meaning of wine and the real beauties of the lilies of the field as none either on chithiron or at enna had ever done the song of isaiah he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him had seemed to him to prefigure himself and in him the prophecy was fulfilled we must not be afraid of such a phrase every single work of art is the fulfilment of a prophecy for every work of art is the conversion of an idea into an image every single human being should be the fulfilment of a prophecy for every human being should be the realization of some ideal either in the mind of god or in the mind of man christ found the type and fixed it and the dream of a virgilian poet either at jerusalem or at babylon became in the long progress of the centuries incarnate in him for whom the world was waiting to me one of the things in history the most to be regretted is that the christ's own renaissance which has produced the cathedral at chartres the arthurian cycle of legends the life of saint francis of assisi the art of giotto and dante's divine comedy was not allowed to develop on its own lines but was interrupted and spoiled by the dreary classical renaissance that gave us petrarch and raphael's frescoes and palladian architecture and formal french tragedy and saint paul's cathedral and pope's poetry and everything that is made from without and by dead rules and does not spring from within through some spirit in forming it but wherever there is a romantic movement in art there somehow and under some form is christ or the soul of christ he is in romeo and juliet in the winter's tale in provencal poetry in the ancient mariner in la belle dame sans merci and in chatterton's ballad of charity we owe to him the most diverse things and people hugo's les miserables baudelaire's fleur du mal the note of pity in russian novels verlaine and verlaine's poems the stained glass and tapestries and the quattrocento work of burne jones and morris belong to him no less than the tower of giotto lancelot and guinevere tannhäuser the troubled romantic marbles of michelangelo pointed architecture and the love of children and flowers for both of which indeed in classical art there was but little place hardly enough for them to grow or play in but which from the twelfth century down to our own day have been continually making their appearances in art under various modes and at various times coming fitfully and wilfully as children as flowers are apt to do spring always seems to one as if the flowers had been in hiding and only came out into the sun because they were afraid that grown-up people would grow tired of looking for them and give up the search 
and the life of a child being no more than an april day on which there is both rain and sun for the narcissus it is the imaginative quality of christ's own nature that makes him this palpitating centre of romance the strange figures of poetic drama and ballad are made by the imagination of others but out of his own imagination entirely did jesus of nazareth create himself the cry of isaiah really had no more to do with his coming than the song of the nightingale has to do with the rising of the moon no more though perhaps no less he was the denial as well as the affirmation of prophecy for every expectation that he fulfilled there was another that he destroyed in all beauty says bacon there is some strangeness of proportion and of those who are born of the spirit of those that is to say who like himself are dynamic forces christ says that they are like the wind that bloweth where it listeth and no man can tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth that is why he is so fascinating to artists he has all the colour elements of life mystery strangeness pathos suggestion ecstasy love he appeals to the temper of wonder and creates that mood in which alone he can be understood and to me it is a joy to remember that if he is of imagination all compact the world itself is of the same substance i said in dorian gray that the great sins of the world take place in the brain but it is in the brain that everything takes place we know now that we do not see with the eyes or hear with the ears they are really channels for the transmission adequate or inadequate of sense impressions it is in the brain that the poppy is red that the apple is odorous that the skylark sings of late i have been studying with diligence the four prose poems about christ at christmas i managed to get hold of a greek testament and every morning after i had cleaned my cell and polished my tins i read a little of the gospels a dozen verses taken by chance anywhere it is a delightful way of opening the day every one even in a turbulent ill-disciplined life should do the same endless repetition in and out of season has spoiled for us the freshness the naivete the simple romantic charm of the gospels we hear them read far too often and far too badly and all repetition is anti-spiritual when one returns to the greek it is like going into a garden of lilies out of some narrow and dark house and to me the pleasure is doubled by the reflection that it is extremely probable that we have the actual terms the ipsissima verba used by christ it was always supposed that christ talked in aramaic even renan thought so but now we know that the galilean peasants like the irish peasants of our own day were bilingual and that greek was the ordinary language of intercourse all over palestine as indeed all over the eastern world i never liked the idea that we knew of christ's own words only through a translation of a translation it is a delight to me to think that as far as his conversation was concerned carmides might have listened to him and socrates reasoned with him and plato understood him that he really said eo i me o poimen o kalos that when he thought of the lilies of the field and how they neither toil nor spin his absolute expression was katayathate tacrina toe airo tos aixene o copia ethernethe and that his last word when he cried out my life has been completed has reached its fulfilment has been perfected was exactly as saint john tells us it was tetelestai no more
while in reading the gospels particularly that of st john himself or whatever early gnostic took his name and mantle i see the continual assertion of the imagination as the basis of all spiritual and material life i see also that to christ imagination was simply a form of love and that to him love was lord in the fullest meaning of the phrase some six weeks ago i was allowed by the doctor to have white bread to eat instead of the coarse black or brown bread of ordinary prison fare it is a great delicacy it will sound strange that dry bread could possibly be a delicacy to any one to me it is so much so that at the close of each meal i carefully eat whatever crumbs may be left on my tin plate or have fallen on the rough towel that one uses as a cloth so as not to soil one's table and i do so not from hunger i get now quite sufficient food but simply in order that nothing should be wasted of what is given to me so one should look on love christ like all fascinating personalities had the power of not merely saying beautiful things himself but of making other people say beautiful things to him and i love the story saint mark tells us about the greek woman who when as a trial of her faith he said to her that he could not give her the bread of the children of israel answered him that the little dogs kenaria little dogs it should be rendered who are under the table eat of the crumbs that the children let fall most people live for love and admiration but it is by love and admiration that we should live if any love is shown us we should recognize that we are quite unworthy of it nobody is worthy to be loved the fact that god loves man shows us that in the divine order of ideal things it is written that eternal love is to be given to what is eternally unworthy or if that phrase seems to be a bitter one to bear let us say that every one is worthy of love except him who thinks that he is love is a sacrament that should be taken kneeling and domine non sam dignus should be on the lips and in the hearts of those who receive it if ever i write again in the sense of producing artistic work there are just two subjects on which and through which i desire to express myself one is christ as the precursor of the romantic movement in life the other is the artistic life considered in its relation to conduct the first is of course intensely fascinating for i see in christ not merely the essentials of the supreme romantic type but all the accidents the wilfulnesses even of the romantic temperament also he was the first person who ever said to people that they should live flower-like lives he fixed the phrase he took children as the type of what people should try to become he held them up as examples to their elders which i myself have always thought the chief use of children if what is perfect should have a use dante describes the soul of a man as coming from the hand of god weeping and laughing like a little child and christ also saw that the soul of each one should be a guisa di fanciulla che piangendo e ridendo pargo leggia he felt that life was changeful fluid active and that to allow it to be stereotyped into any form was death he saw that people should not be too serious over material common interests that to be unpractical was to be a great thing that one should not bother too much over affairs the birds didn't why should man he is charming when he says take no thought for the morrow is not the soul more than meat is not the body more than raiment a greek might have used the latter phrase it is full of greek feeling 
but only Christ could have said both, and so summed up life perfectly for us. His morality is all sympathy, just what morality should be. If the only thing that he ever said had been, her sins are forgiven her because she loved much, it would have been worth while dying to have said it. His justice is all poetical justice, exactly what justice should be. The beggar goes to heaven because he has been unhappy. I cannot conceive a better reason for his being sent there. The people who work for an hour in the vineyard in the cool of the evening receive just as much reward as those who have toiled there all day long in the hot sun. Why shouldn't they? Probably no one deserved anything. Or perhaps they were a different kind of people. Christ had no patience with the dull, lifeless, mechanical systems that treat people as if they were things, and so treat everybody alike. For him there were no laws, there were exceptions merely, as if anybody, or anything for that matter, was like aught else in the world. That which is the very keynote of romantic art was to him the proper basis of natural life. He saw no other basis, and when they brought him one, taken in the very act of sin, and showed him her sentence written in the law, and asked him what was to be done, he wrote with his finger on the ground as though he did not hear them, and finally, when they pressed him again, looked up and said, let him of you who has never sinned be the first to throw the stone at her. It was worth while living to have said that. Like all poetical natures, he loved ignorant people. He knew that in the soul of one who is ignorant there is always room for a great idea. But he could not stand stupid people, especially those who are made stupid by education. People who are full of opinions not one of which they even understand, a peculiarly modern type, summed up by Christ when he describes it as the type of one who has the key of knowledge, cannot use it himself, and does not allow other people to use it, though it may be made to open the gate of God's kingdom. His chief war was against the Philistines. That is the war every child of light has to wage, Philistinism was the note of the age and community in which he lived. In their heavy inaccessibility to ideas, their dull respectability, their tedious orthodoxy, their worship of vulgar success, their entire preoccupation with the gross materialistic side of life, and their ridiculous estimate of themselves and their importance, the Jews of Jerusalem in Christ's day were the exact counterpart of the British Philistine of our own. Christ mocked at the whited sepulchre of respectability, and fixed that phrase forever. He treated worldly success as a thing absolutely to be despised. He saw nothing in it at all. He looked on wealth as an encumbrance to a man, he would not hear of life being sacrificed to any system of thought or morals. He pointed out that forms and ceremonies were made for man, not man for forms and ceremonies. He took Sabbatarianism as a type of the things that should be set at naught. The cold philanthropies, the ostentatious public charities, the tedious formalisms so dear to the middle-class mind he exposed with utter and relentless scorn. To us what is termed orthodoxy is merely a facile unintelligent acquiescence, but to them, and in their hands, it was a terrible and paralysing tyranny. Christ swept it aside. He showed that the spirit alone was of value, he took a keen pleasure in pointing out to them that, though they were always reading the Lord and the prophets, they had not really the smallest idea of what either of them meant. In opposition to their tithing of each separate day into the fixed routine of prescribed duties, as they tithe mint and rue, 
he preached the enormous importance of living completely for the moment. Those whom he saved from their sins are saved simply for beautiful moments in their lives. Mary Magdalene, when she sees Christ, breaks the rich vase of alabaster that one of her seven lovers had given her, and spills the odorous spices over his tired, dusty feet, and for that one moment's sake sits forever with Ruth and Beatrice in the tresses of the snow-white rose of paradise. All that Christ says to us by the way of a little warning is that every moment should be beautiful, that the soul should always be ready for the coming of the bridegroom, always waiting for the voice of the lover. Philistinism being simply that side of man's nature that is not illumined by the imagination, he sees all the lovely influences of life as modes of light. The imagination itself is the world of light. The world is made by it, and yet the world cannot understand it. That is because the imagination is simply a manifestation of love, and it is love and the capacity for it that distinguishes one human being from another. But it is when he deals with a sinner that Christ is most romantic, in the sense of most real. The world had always loved the saint as being the nearest possible approach to the perfection of God. Christ, through some divine instinct in him, seems to have always loved the sinner as being the nearest possible approach to the perfection of man. His primary desire was not to reform people any more than his primary desire was to relieve suffering. To turn an interesting thief into a tedious, honest man was not his aim. He would have thought little of the Prisoner's Aid Society and other modern movements of the kind. The conversion of a publican into a Pharisee would not have seemed to him a great achievement, but in a manner not yet understood of the world he regarded sin and suffering as being in themselves beautiful holy things and modes of perfection it seems a very dangerous idea it is all great ideas are dangerous that it was christ's creed admits of no doubt that it is the true creed i don't doubt myself of course the sinner must repent. But why? Simply because otherwise he would be unable to realise what he had done. The moment of repentance is the moment of initiation. More than that, it is the means by which one alters one's past. The Greeks thought that impossible. They often say in their gnomic aphorisms, even the gods cannot alter the past. Christ showed that the commonest sinner could do it, that it was the one thing he could do. Christ, had he been asked, would have said, I feel quite certain about it, that the moment the prodigal son fell on his knees and wept, he made his having wasted his substance with harlots, his swine herding and hungering for the husks they ate, beautiful and holy moments in his life. It is difficult for most people to grasp the idea. I dare say one has to go to prison to understand it. If so, it may be worth while going to prison. End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas, De Profundis Expurgated, Part 4, from De Profundis, 1913, Matthewan Edition. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There is something so unique about Christ. Of course, just as there are false dawns before the dawn itself, and winter days so full of sudden sunlight that they will cheat the wise crocus into squandering its gold before its time, and make some foolish bird call to its mate to build on barren boughs, so there were Christians before Christ. For that we should be grateful. 
the unfortunate thing is that there have been none since i make one exception saint francis of assisi but then god had given him at his birth the soul of a poet as he himself when quite young had in mystical marriage taken poverty as his bride and with the soul of a poet and the body of a beggar he found the way to perfection not difficult he understood christ and so he became like him we do not require the liber conformitatum to teach us that the life of saint francis was the true imitatio christi a poem compared to which the book of that name is merely prose indeed that is the charm about christ when all is said he is just like a work of art he does not really teach one anything but by being brought into his presence one becomes something and everybody is predestined to his presence once at least in his life each man walks with christ to emmaus as regards the other subject the relation of the artistic life to conduct it will no doubt seem strange to you that i should select it people point to reading jail and say that is where the artistic life leads a man well it might lead to worse places the more mechanical people to whom life is a shrewd speculation depending on a careful calculation of ways and means always know where they are going and go there they start with the ideal desire of being the parish beadle and in whatever sphere they are placed they succeed in being the parish beadle and no more a man whose desire is to be something separate from himself to be a member of parliament or a successful grocer or a prominent solicitor or a judge or something equally tedious invariably succeeds in being what he wants to be that is his punishment those who want a mask have to wear it but with the dynamic forces of life and those in whom those dynamic forces become incarnate it is different people whose desire is solely for self-realization never know where they're going they can't know in one sense of the word it is of course necessary as the greek oracle said to know oneself that is the first achievement of knowledge but to recognize that the soul of a man is unknowable is the ultimate achievement of wisdom the final mystery is oneself when one has weighed the sun in the balance and measured the steps of the moon and mapped out the seven heavens star by star there still remains oneself who can calculate the orbit of his own soul when the son went out to look for his father's asses he did not know that a man of god was waiting for him with a very chrism of coronation and that his own soul was already the soul of a king i hope to live long enough and to produce work of such a character that i shall be able at the end of my days to say yes this is just where the artistic life leads a man two of the most perfect lives i have come across in my own experience are the lives of verlaine and of prince kropotkin both of them men who have passed years in prison the first the one christian poet since dante the other a man with a soul of that beautiful white christ which seems coming out of russia and for the last seven or eight months in spite of a succession of great troubles reaching me from the outside world almost without intermission i have been placed in direct contact with a new spirit working in this prison through man and things that has helped me beyond any possibility of expression in words so that while for the first year of my imprisonment i did nothing else and can remember doing nothing else but wring my hands in impotent despair and say what an ending what an appalling ending now i try to say to myself and 
sometimes when i am not torturing myself do really and sincerely say what a beginning what a wonderful beginning it may really be so it may become so if it does i shall owe much to this new personality that has altered every man's life in this place you may realise it when i say that had i been released last may as i tried to be i would have left this place loathing it and every official in it with a bitterness of hatred that would have poisoned my life i have had a year longer of imprisonment but humanity has been in the prison along with us all and now when i go out i shall always remember great kindnesses that i have received here from almost everybody and on the day of my release i shall give many thanks to many people and ask to be remembered by them in turn the prison style is absolutely and entirely wrong i would give anything to be able to alter it when i go out i intend to try but there is nothing in the world so wrong but that the spirit of humanity which is the spirit of love the spirit of the christ who is not in churches may make it if not right at least possible to be born without too much bitterness of heart i know also that much is waiting for me outside that is very delightful from what saint francis of assisi calls my brother the wind and my sister the rain lovely things both of them down to the shop windows and sunsets of great cities if i made a list of all that still remains to me i don't know where i should stop for indeed god made the world just as much for me as for any one else perhaps i may go out with something that i had not got before i need not tell you that to me reformations in morals are as meaningless and vulgar as reformations in theology but while to propose to be a better man is a piece of unscientific cant to have become a deeper man is the privilege of those who have suffered and such i think i have become if after i am free a friend of mine gives a feast and did not invite me to it i should not mind a bit i can be perfectly happy by myself with freedom flowers books and the moon who could not be perfectly happy besides feasts are not for me any more i have given too many to care about them that side of life is over for me very fortunately i dare say but if after i am free a friend of mine had a sorrow and refused to allow me to share it i should feel it most bitterly if he shut the doors of his house of mourning against me i would come back again and again and beg to be admitted so that i might share in what i was entitled to share in if he thought me unworthy unfit to weep with him i should feel it as the most poignant humiliation as the most terrible mode in which disgrace could be inflicted on me but that could not be i have a right to share in sorrow and he who can look at the loveliness of the world and share its sorrow and realise something of the wonder of both is in immediate contact with divine things and has got as near to god's secret as any one can get perhaps there may come into my art also no less than into my life a still deeper note one of greater unity of passion and directness of impulse not width but intensity is the true aim of modern art we are no longer in art concerned with the type it is with the exception that we have to do i cannot put my sufferings into any form they took i need hardly say art only begins where imitation ends but something must come into my work of fuller memory of words perhaps of richer cadences of more curious effects of simpler architectural order of some aesthetic quality at any rate when marcius was torn from the scabbard of his limbs 
della vagina della membre sue, to use one of Dante's most terrible Tacitean phrases, he had no more song, the Greek said. Apollo had been victor. The lyre had vanquished the reed. But perhaps the Greeks were mistaken. I hear in much modern art the cry of Marcius. It is bitter in Baudelaire, sweet and plaintive in Lamartine, mystic in Verlaine. It is in the deferred resolutions of Chopin's music. It is in the discontent that haunts Burne Jones's women. Even Matthew Arnold, whose Song of Callicles tells of the triumph of the sweet persuasive lyre and the famous final victory in such a clear note of lyrical beauty has not a little of it in the troubled undertone of doubt and distress that haunts his verses neither goethe nor wordsworth could help him though he followed each in turn and when he seeks to mourn for theasis or to sing of the scholar gypsy it is the reed that he has to take for the rendering of his strain but whether or not the Phrygian fawn was silent, I cannot be. Expression is as necessary to me as leaf and blossoms are to the black branches of the trees that show themselves above the prison walls and are so restless in the wind. Between my art and the world there is now a wide gulf, but between art and myself there is none. I hope, at least, that there is none. To each of us different fates are meted out. My lot has been one of public infamy, of long imprisonment, of misery, of ruin, of disgrace, but I am not worthy of it, not yet at any rate. I remember that I used to say that I thought I could bear a real tragedy if it came to me with purple pall, and a mask of noble sorrow, but that the dreadful thing about modernity was that it put tragedy into the raiment of comedy, so that the great realities seemed commonplace or grotesque or lacking in style. It is quite true about modernity. It has probably always been true about actual life. It is said that all martyrdoms seemed mean to the looker-on, the nineteenth century is no exception to the rule. Everything about my tragedy has been hideous, mean, repellent, lacking in style. Our very dress makes us grotesque. We are the zanies of sorrow. We are clowns whose hearts are broken. We are specially designed to appeal to the sense of humour, on November 13th, 1895, I was brought down here from London. From two o'clock till half-past two on that day, I had to stand on the centre platform of Clapham Junction in convict dress and handcuffed for the world to look at. I had been taken out of the hospital ward without a moment's notice being given to me. Of all possible objects, I was the most grotesque, when people saw me, they laughed. Each train as it came up swelled the audience. Nothing could exceed their amusement. That was, of course, before they knew who I was. As soon as they had been informed, they laughed still more. For half an hour I stood there in the grey November rain, surrounded by a jeering mob. For a year after that was done to me, I wept every day at the same hour and for the same space of time. That is not such a tragic thing as possibly it sounds to you. To those who are in prison, tears are a part of every day's experience. A day in prison on which one does not weep is a day on which one's heart is hard, not a day on which one's heart is happy. Well, now I am really beginning to feel more regret for the people who laughed than for myself. Of course, when they saw me, I was not on my pedestal, I was in the pillory. 
but it is a very unimaginative nature that only cares for people on their pedestals a pedestal may be a very unreal thing a pillory is a terrific reality they should have known also how to interpret sorrow better i have said that behind sorrow there is always sorrow it were wiser still to say that behind sorrow there is always a soul and to mock at a soul in pain is a dreadful thing in the strangely simple economy of the world people only get what they give and to those who have not enough imagination to penetrate the mere outward of things and feel pity what pity can be given save that of scorn i write this account of the mode of my being transferred here simply that it should be realised how hard it has been for me to get anything out of my punishment but bitterness and despair i have however to do it and now and then i have moments of submission and acceptance all the spring may be hidden in the single bud and the low ground nest of the lark may hold the joy that is to herald the feet of many rose-red dawns so perhaps whatever beauty of life still remains to me is contained in some moment of surrender abasement and humiliation i can at any rate merely proceed on the lines of my own development and accepting all that has happened to me make myself worthy of it people used to say of me that i was too individualistic i must be far more of an individualist than ever i was i must get far more out of myself than ever i got and ask far less of the world than ever i asked indeed my ruin came not from too great individualism of life but from too little the one disgraceful unpardonable and to all time contemptible action of my life was to allow myself to appeal to society for help and protection to have made such an appeal would have been from the individualist point of view bad enough but what excuse can there ever be put forward for having made it of course once i had put into motion the forces of society society turned on me and said have you been living all this time in defiance of my laws and do you now appeal to those laws for protection you shall have those laws exercised to the full you shall abide by what you have appealed to the result is i am in jail certainly no man ever fell so ignobly and by such ignoble instruments as i did the philistine element in life is not the failure to understand art charming people such as fishermen shepherds ploughboys peasants and the like know nothing about art and are the very salt of the earth he is the philistine who upholds and aids the heavy cumbrous blind mechanical forces of society and who does not recognise dynamic force when he meets it either in a man or in movement people thought it dreadful of me to have entertained at dinner the evil things of life and to have found pleasure in their company but then from the point of view through which i as an artist in life approach them they were delightfully suggestive and stimulating the danger was half the excitement my business as an artist was with ariel i set myself to wrestle with caliban a great friend of mine a friend of ten years standing came to see me some time ago and told me that he did not believe a single word of what was said against me and wished me to know that he considered me quite innocent and the victim of a hideous plot i burst into tears at what he said and told him that while there was much amongst the definite charges that was quite untrue and transferred to me by revolting malice still that my life had been full of perverse pleasures 
and that unless he accepted that as a fact about me and realised it to the full i could not possibly be friends with him any more or ever be in his company it was a terrible shock to him but we are friends and i have not got his friendship on false pretences emotional forces as i say somewhere in intentions are as limited in extent and duration as the forces of physical energy the little cup that is made to hold so much can hold so much and no more though all the purple vats of burgundy be filled with wine to the brim and the treaders stand knee-deep in the gathered grapes of the stony vineyards of spain there is no error more common than that of thinking that those who were the causes or occasions of great tragedies share in the feelings suitable to the tragic mood no error more fatal than expecting it of them the martyr in his shirt of flame may be looking on the face of god but to him who is piling the faggots or loosening the logs for the blast the whole scene is no more than the slaying of an ox is to the butcher or the felling of a tree to the charcoal burner in the forest or the fall of a flower to one who is mowing down the grass with a scythe great passions are for the great of soul and great events can be seen only by those who are on a level with them i know of nothing in all drama more incomparable from the point of view of art nothing more suggestive in its subtlety of observation than shakespeare's drawing of rosencrantz and guildenstern they are hamlet's college friends they have been his companions they bring with them memories of pleasant days together at the moment when they come across him in the play he is staggering under the weight of a burden intolerable to one of his temperament the dead have come armed out of the grave to impose on him a mission at once too great and too mean for him he is a dreamer and he is called upon to act he has the nature of the poet and he is asked to grapple with the common complexity of cause and effect with life in its practical realization of which he knows nothing not with life in its ideal essence of which he knows so much he has no conception of what to do and his folly is to feign folly brutus used madness as a cloak to conceal the sword of his purpose the dagger of his will but the hamlet madness is a mere mask for the hiding of weakness in the making of fancies and jests he sees a chance of delay he keeps playing with action as an artist plays with a theory he makes himself the spy of his proper actions and listening to his own words knows them to be but words 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 instead of trying to be the hero of his own history he seeks to be the spectator of his own tragedy he disbelieves in everything including himself and yet his doubt helps him not as it comes not from scepticism but from a divided will of all this guildenstern and rosencrantz realize nothing they bow and smirk and smile and what the one says the other echoes with sickliest intonation when at last by means of the play within the play and the puppets in their dalliance hamlet catches the conscience of the king and drives the wretched man in terror from his throne guildenstern and rosencrantz see no more in his conduct than a rather painful breach of court etiquette that is as far as they can attain to in the contemplation of the spectacle of life with appropriate emotions they are close to his very secret and know nothing of it nor would there be any use in telling them they are the little cups that can hold so much and no more 
towards the close it is suggested that caught in a cunning spring set for another they have met or may meet with a violent and sudden death but a tragic ending of this kind though touched by hamlet's humour with something of the surprise and justice of comedy is really not for such as they they never die horatio who in order to report hamlet and his cause aright to the unsatisfied absence him from felicity a while and in this harsh world draws his breath in pain dies but guildenstern and rosencrantz are as immortal as angelo and tartuffe and should rank with them they are what modern life has contributed to the antique ideal of friendship he who writes a new de amicitia must find a niche for them and praise them in tusculan prose they are types fixed for all time to censure them would show a lack of appreciation they are merely out of their sphere that is all in sublimity of soul there is no contagion high thoughts and high emotions are by their very existence isolated i am to be released if all goes well with me towards the end of may and hope to go at once to some little seaside village along with r blank and m blank the sea as euripides says in one of his plays about iphigenia washes away the stains and wounds of the world i hope to be at least a month with my friends and to gain peace and balance and a less troubled heart and a sweeter mood i have a strange longing for the great simple primeval things such as the sea to me no less of a mother than the earth it seems to me that we all look at nature too much and live with her too little i discern great sanity in the greek attitude they never chattered about sunsets or discussed whether the shadows on the grass were really mauve or not but they saw that the sea was for the swimmer and the sand for the feet of the runner they loved the trees for the shadow that they cast and the forest for its silence at noon the vineyard dresser wreathed his hair with ivy that he might keep off the rays of the sun as he stooped over the young shoots and for the artist and the athlete the two types that greece gave us they plaited with garlands the leaves of the bitter laurel and of the wild parsley which else had been of no service to men we call ours a utilitarian age and we do not know the uses of any single thing we have forgotten that water can cleanse and fire purify and that the earth is mother to us all as a consequence our art is of the moon and plays with shadows while greek art is of the sun and deals directly with things i feel sure that in elemental forces there is purification and i want to go back to them and live in their presence of course to one so modern as i am enfant de mon siècle merely to look at the world will be always lovely i tremble with pleasure when i think that on the very day of my leaving prison both the laburnum and the lilac will be blooming in the gardens and that i shall see the wind stir into restless beauty the swaying gold of the one and make the other toss the pale purple of its plumes so that all the air shall be arabia for me linnaeus fell on his knees and wept for joy when he saw for the first time the long heath of some english upland made yellow with the tawny aromatic brooms of the common firs and i know that for me to whom flowers are part of desire there are tears waiting in the petals of some rose it has always been so with me from my boyhood 
there is not a single colour hidden away in the chalice of a flower or the curve of a shell to which by some subtle sympathy with the very soul of things my nature does not answer like gautier i have always been one of those pour qui le monde visible existe still i am conscious now that behind all this beauty satisfying though it may be there is some spirit hidden of which the painted forms and shapes are but modes of manifestation and it is with this spirit that i desire to become in harmony i have grown tired of the articulate utterances of men and things the mystical in art the mystical in life the mystical in nature this is what i am looking for it is absolutely necessary for me to find it somewhere all trials are trials for one's life just as all sentences are sentences of death and three times have i been tried the first time i left the box to be arrested the second time to be led back to the house of detention the third time to pass into a prison for two years society as we have constituted it will have no place for me has none to offer but nature whose sweet rains fall on unjust and just alike will have clefts in the rocks where i may hide and secret valleys in whose silence i may weep undisturbed she will hang the night with stars so that i may walk abroad in the darkness without stumbling and send the wind over my footprints so that none may track me to my hurt she will cleanse me in great waters and with bitter herbs make me whole End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas, the unpublished portion of De Profundis, Part One. From Oscar Wilde, his Life and Confessions by Frank Harris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The unpublished portion of De Profundis. This is not the whole of the unpublished portion of De Profundis, but that part only which was read out in court and used for the purpose of discrediting Lord Alfred Douglas. Still, it is more than half of the whole in length, and absolutely more than the whole in importance. Nothing of any moment is omitted, except the reiteration of accusations, and just this repetition weakens the effect of the argument, and strengthens the impression of querulous nagging instead of dispassionate statement if the whole were printed oscar wilde would stand worse somewhat more selfish and more vindictive i have commented the document as it stands mainly for the sake of clearness and because it justifies in every particular and almost in every epithet the shadows of the portrait which i have endeavoured to paint in this book curiously enough oscar wilde depicts himself unconsciously in this part of de profundis in a more unfavourable light than that accorded him in my memory i believe mine is the more faithful portrait of him but that is for my readers to determine frank harris new york december nineteen fifteen h m prison reading dear bosie after long and fruitless waiting i have determined to write to you myself as much for your sake as for mine as i would not like to think that i had passed through two long years of imprisonment without ever having received a single line from you or any news or message even except such as gave me pain our ill-fated and most lamentable friendship has ended in ruin and public infamy for me yet the memory of our ancient affection is often with me and the thought that loathing bitterness and contempt should for ever take the place in my heart once held by love is very sad to me and you yourself will i think 
feel in your heart that to write to me as i lie in the loneliness of prison life is better than to publish my letters without my permission or to dedicate poems to me unasked though the world will know nothing of whatever words of grief or passion of remorse or indifference you may choose to send as your answer or your appeal i have no doubt that in this letter which i have to write of your life and mine of the past and of the future of sweet things changed to bitterness and of bitter things that may be turned to joy there will be much that will wound your vanity to the quick if it prove so read the letter over and over again till it kills your vanity if you find in it something of which you feel that you are unjustly accused remember that one should be grateful that there is any fault of which one can be unjustly accused if there be in it one single passage that brings tears to your eyes weep as we weep in prison where the day no less than the night is set apart for tears it is the only thing that can save you if you go complaining to your mother as you did with reference to the scorn of you i displayed in my letter to robbie so that she may flatter and soothe you back into self-complacency or conceit you will be completely lost if you find one false excuse for yourself you will soon find a hundred and be just what you were before do you still say as you said to robbie in your answer that i attribute unworthy motives to you ah you had no motives in life you had appetites merely a motive is an intellectual aim that you were very young when our friendship began your defect was not that you knew so little about life but that you knew so much the morning dawn of boyhood with its delicate bloom its clear pure light its joy of innocence and expectation you had left far behind you with very swift and running feet you had passed from romance to realism the gutter and the things that live in it had begun to fascinate you that was the origin of the trouble in which you sought my aid and i unwisely according to the wisdom of this world out of pity and kindness gave it to you you must read this letter right through though each word may become to you as the fire or knife of the surgeon that makes the delicate flesh burn or bleed remember that the fool to the eyes of the gods and the fool to the eyes of man are very different one who is entirely ignorant of the modes of art in its revelation or the moods of thought in its progress of the pomp of the latin line or the richer music of the voweled greek of tuscan sculpture or elizabethan song may yet be full of the very sweetest wisdom the real fool such as the gods mock or mar is he who does not know himself i was such a one too long you have been such a one too long be so no more do not be afraid the supreme vice is shallowness everything that is realized is right remember also that whatever is misery to you to read is still greater misery to me to set down they have permitted you to see the strange and tragic shapes of life as one sees shadows in a crystal the head of medusa that turns living men to stone you have been allowed to look at in a mirror merely you yourself have walked free among the flowers from me the beautiful world of colour and motion has been taken away i will begin by telling you that i blame myself terribly as i sit in this dark cell in convict clothes a disgraced and ruined man i blame myself 
in the perturbed and fitful nights of anguish, in the long monotonous days of pain, it is myself I blame. I blame myself for allowing an intellectual friendship, a friendship whose primary aim was not the creation and contemplation of beautiful things, entirely to dominate my life. From the very first there was too wide a gap between us. You had been idle at your school, worse than idle at your university. You did not realise that an artist, and especially such an artist as I am, one, that is to say, the quality of whose work depends on the intensification of personality, requires an intellectual atmosphere, quiet, peace, and solitude. You admired my work when it was finished, you enjoyed the brilliant successes of my first nights, and the brilliant banquets that followed them. You were proud, and quite naturally so, of being the intimate friend of an artist so distinguished. But you could not understand the conditions requisite for the production of artistic work. I am not speaking in phrases of rhetorical exaggeration, but in terms of absolute truth, to actual fact, when I remind you that during the whole time we were together I never wrote one single line. Whether at Torquay, Goring, London, Florence, or elsewhere, my life, as long as you were by my side, was entirely sterile and uncreative, and with but few intervals you were, I regret to say, by my side always. I remember, for instance, in September 93, to select merely one instance out of many, taking a set of chambers, purely in order to work undisturbed, as I had broken my contract with John Hare, for whom I had promised to write a play, and who was pressing me on the subject. During the first week you kept away. We had, not unnaturally indeed, differed on the question of the artistic value of your translation of Salome. So you contented yourself with sending me foolish letters on the subject. In that week I wrote and completed in every detail, as it was ultimately performed, the first act of An Ideal Husband. The second week you returned, and my work practically had to be given up. I arrived at St. James's Place every morning at 11.30 in order to have the opportunity of thinking and writing without the interruption inseparable from my own household, quiet and peaceful as that household was. But the attempt was vain. At twelve o'clock you drove up and stayed smoking cigarettes and chattering till one-thirty, when I had to take you out to luncheon at the Café Royal, or the Barclay. Luncheon, with its liqueurs, lasted usually till three-thirty. For an hour you retired to White's. At tea-time you appeared again and stayed till it was time to dress for dinner. You dined with me either at the Savoy or at Tite Street. We did not separate as a rule till after midnight, as supper at Willis's had to wind up the entrancing day. That was my life for those three months, every single day, except during the four days when you went abroad. I then, of course, had to go over to Calais to fetch you back. For one of my nature and temperament, it was a position at once grotesque and tragic. You surely must realise that now. You must see now that your incapacity of being alone, your nature so exigent in its persistent claim on the attention and time of others, your lack of any power of sustained intellectual concentration, the unfortunate accident, for I like to think it was no more, that you had not been able to acquire the Oxford temper in intellectual matters, never, I mean, been one who could play gracefully with ideas, but had arrived at violence of opinion merely that all these things, combined with the fact that your desires and your interests were in life, not in art, were as destructive to your own progress in culture 
as they were to my work as an artist when i compare my friendship with you to my friendship with still younger men as john gray and pierre louis i feel ashamed my real life my higher life was with them and such as they of the appalling results of my friendship with you i don't speak at present i am thinking merely of its quality while it lasted it was intellectually degrading to me you had the rudiments of an artistic temperament in its germ but i met you either too late or too soon i don't know which when you were away i was all right the moment in the early december of the year to which i have been alluding i had succeeded in inducing your mother to send you out of england i collected again the torn and ravelled web of my imagination got my life back into my own hands and not merely finished the three remaining acts of the ideal husband but conceived and had almost completed two other plays of a completely different type the florentine tragedy and la sainte courtesane when suddenly unbidden unwelcome and under circumstances fatal to my happiness you returned the two works left then imperfect i was unable to take up again the mood that created them i could not recover you now having yourself published a volume of verse will be able to recognize the truth of everything i have said here whether you can or not it remains as a hideous truth in the very heart of our friendship while you were with me you were the absolute ruin of my art and in allowing you to stand persistently between art and myself i give to myself shame and blame in the fullest degree you couldn't appreciate you couldn't know you couldn't understand i had no right to expect it of you at all your interests were merely in your meals and moods your desires were simply for amusements for ordinary or less ordinary pleasures they were what your temperament needed or thought it needed for the moment i should have forbidden you my house and my chambers except when i specially invited you i blame myself without reserve for my weakness it was merely weakness one half hour with art is always more to me than a cycle with you nothing really at any period of my life was ever of the smallest importance to me compared with art but in the case of an artist weakness is nothing less than a crime when it is a weakness that paralyzes the imagination i blame myself for having allowed you to bring me to utter and discreditable financial ruin i remember one morning in the early october of ninety two sitting in the yellowing woods at bracknell with your mother at that time i knew very little of your real nature i had stayed from a saturday to monday with you at oxford you had stayed with me at cromer for ten days and played golf the conversation turned on you and your mother began to speak to me about your character she told me of your two chief faults your vanity and your being as she termed it all wrong about money i have a distinct recollection of how i laughed i had no idea that the first would bring me to prison and the second to bankruptcy i thought vanity a sort of graceful flower for a young man to wear as for extravagance the virtues of prudence and thrift were not in my own nature or my own race but before our friendship was one month older i began to see what your mother really meant your insistence on a life of reckless profusion your incessant demands for money your claim that all your pleasures should be paid for by me whether i was with you or not 
brought me after some time into serious monetary difficulties and what made the extravagance to me at any rate so monotonously uninteresting as your persistent grasp on my life grew stronger and stronger was that the money was spent on little more than the pleasures of eating drinking and the like now and then it is a joy to have one's table red with wine and roses but you outstripped all taste and temperance you demanded without grace and received without thanks you grew to think that you had a sort of right to live at my expense and in a profuse luxury to which you had never been accustomed and which for that reason made your appetites all the more keen and at the end if you lost money gambling in some algiers casino you simply telegraphed next morning to me in london to lodge the amount of your losses to your account at your bank and gave the matter no further thought of any kind when i tell you that between the autumn of eighteen ninety two and the date of my imprisonment i spent with you and on you more than five thousand pounds in actual money irrespective of the bills i incurred you will have some idea of the sort of life on which you insisted do you think i exaggerate my ordinary expenses with you for an ordinary day in london for luncheon dinner supper amusements hansoms and the rest of it ranged from twelve to twenty pounds and the week's expenses were naturally in proportion and ranged from eighty pounds to a hundred and thirty pounds for our three months at goring my expenses rent of course included were one thousand three hundred and forty pounds step by step with the bankruptcy receiver i had to go over every item of my life it was horrible plain living and high thinking was of course an ideal you could not at that time have appreciated but such an extravagance was a disgrace to both of us one of the most delightful dinners i remember ever having had is one robbie and i had together in a little soho cafe which cost about as many shillings as my dinners to you used to cost pounds out of my dinner with robbie came the first and best of all my dialogues idea title treatment mode everything was struck out at a three franc fifty centime table d'hote out of the reckless dinners with you nothing remains but the memory that too much was eaten and too much was drunk and my yielding to your demands was bad for you you know that now it made you grasping often at times not a little unscrupulous ungracious always there was on far too many occasions too little joy or privilege in being your host you forgot i will not say the formal courtesy of thanks for formal courtesies will strain a close friendship but simply the grace of sweet companionship the charm of pleasant conversation and all those gentle humanities that make life lovely and are an accompaniment to life as music might be keeping things in tune and filling with melody the harsh or silent places and though it may seem strange to you that one in the terrible position in which i am situated should find a difference between one disgrace and another still i frankly admit that the folly of throwing away all this money on you and letting you squander my fortune to your own hurt as well as to mine gives to me and in my eyes a note of common profligacy to my bankruptcy that makes me doubly ashamed of it i was made for other things but most of all i blame myself for the entire ethical degradation i allowed you to bring on me the basis of character is will-power and my will-power became absolutely subject to yours it sounds a grotesque thing to say 
but it is none the less true those incessant scenes that seemed to be almost physically necessary to you and in which your mind and body grew distorted and you became a thing as terrible to look at as to listen to that dreadful mania you inherit from your father the mania for writing revolting and loathsome letters your entire lack of any control over your emotions as displayed in your long resentful moods of sullen silence no less than in the sudden fits of almost epileptic rage all these things in reference to which one of my letters to you left by you lying about in the savoy or some other hotel and so produced in court by your father's counsel contained an entreaty not devoid of pathos had you at that time been able to recognise pathos either in its elements or its expression these i say were the origin and causes of my fatal yielding to you in your daily increasing demands you wore me out it was the triumph of the smaller over the bigger nature it was the case of that tyranny of the weak over the strong which somewhere in one of my plays i describe as being the only tyranny that lasts and it was inevitable in every relation of life with others one has to find some moyen de vivre i had always thought that my giving up to you in small things meant nothing that when a great moment arrived i could myself reassert my will-power in its natural superiority it was not so at the great moment my will-power completely failed me in life there is really no great or small thing all things are of equal value and of equal size my habit due to indifference chiefly at first of giving up to you in everything had become insensibly a real part of my nature without my knowing it it had stereotyped my temperament to one permanent and fatal mood that is why in the subtle epilogue to the first edition of his essays pater says that failure is to form habits when he said it the dull oxford people thought the phrase a mere wilful inversion of the somewhat wearisome text of aristotelian ethics but there is a wonderful and terrible truth hidden in it i had allowed you to sap my strength of character and to me the formation of a habit had proved to be not failure merely but ruin ethically you had been even still more destructive to me than you had been artistically the warrant once granted your will of course directed everything at a time when i should have been in london taking wise counsel and calmly considering the hideous trap in which i had allowed myself to be caught the booby trap as your father calls it to the present day you insisted on my taking you to monte carlo of all revolting places on god's earth that all day and all night as well you might gamble as long as the casino remained open as for me baccarat having no charms for me i was left alone outside by myself you refused to discuss even for five minutes the position to which you and your father had brought me my business was merely to pay your hotel expenses and your losses the slightest allusion to the ordeal awaiting me was regarded as a bore a new brand of champagne that was recommended to us had more interest for you on our return to london those of my friends who really desired my welfare implored me to retire abroad and not to face an impossible trial you imputed mean motives to them for giving such advice and cowardice to me for listening to it you forced me to stay to brazen it out if possible in the box by absurd and silly perjuries 
at the end of course i was arrested and your father became the hero of the hour as far as i can make out i ended my friendship with you every three months regularly and each time that i did so you managed by means of entreaties telegrams letters the interposition of your friends the interposition of mine and the like to induce me to allow you back but the froth and folly of our life grew often very wearisome to me it was only in the mire that we met and fascinating terribly fascinating though the one topic round which your talk invariably centred was still at the end it became quite monotonous to me i was often bored to death by it and accepted it as i accepted your passion for music halls or your mania for absurd extravagance in eating and drinking or any other of your to me less attractive characteristics as a thing that is to say that one simply had to put up with a part of the high price one had to pay for knowing you when you came one monday evening to my rooms accompanied by two of your friends i found myself actually flying abroad next morning to escape from you giving my family some absurd reason for my sudden departure and leaving a false address with my servant for fear you might follow me by the next train our friendship had always been a source of distress to my wife not merely because she had never liked you personally but because she saw how your continual companionship altered me and not for the better you started without delay for paris sending me passionate telegrams on the road to beg me to see you at once at any rate i declined you arrived in paris late on a saturday night and found a brief letter from me waiting for you at your hotel stating that i would not see you next morning i received in tite street a telegram of some ten or eleven pages in length from you you stated in it that no matter what you had done to me you could not believe that i would absolutely decline to see you you reminded me that for the sake of seeing me even for one hour you had travelled six days and six nights across europe without stopping once on the way you made what i must admit was a most pathetic appeal and ended with what seemed to me a threat of suicide and one not thinly veiled you had yourself often told me how many of your race there had been who had stained their hands in their own blood your uncle certainly your grandfather possibly many others in the mad bad line from which you come pity my old affection for you regard for your mother to whom your death under such dreadful circumstances would have been a blow almost too great for her to bear the horror of the idea that so young a life and one that amidst all its ugly faults had still promise of beauty in it should come to so revolting an end mere humanity itself all these if excuses be necessary must serve as an excuse for consenting to accord you one last interview when i arrived in paris your tears breaking out again and again all through the evening and falling over your cheeks like rain as we sat at dinner first at voisines at supper at pilard's afterwards the unfeigned joy you evinced at seeing me holding my hand whenever you could as though you were a gentle and penitent child your contrition so simple and sincere at the moment made me consent to renew our friendship two days after we had returned to london your father saw you having luncheon with me at the cafe royal joined my table drank of my wine and that afternoon through a letter addressed to you began his first attack on me 
End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas, the unpublished portion of De Profundis, Part Two, from Oscar Wilde: His Life and Confessions by Frank Harris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It may be strange, but I had once again, I will not say the chance, but the duty, of separating from you forced on me. I need hardly remind you that I refer to your conduct to me at Brighton from October 10th to 13th, 1894. Three years is a long time for you to go back, but we who live in prison, and in whose lives there is no event but sorrow, have to measure time by throbs of pain and the record of bitter moments. We have nothing else to think of. Suffering, curious as it may sound to you, is the means by which we exist, because it is the only means by which we become conscious of existing, and the remembrance of suffering in the past is necessary to us as the warrant, the evidence, of our continued identity. Between myself and the memory of joy lies a gulf no less deep than that between myself and joy in its actuality. Had our life together been as the world fancied it to be, one simply of pleasure, profligacies and laughter, I would not be able to recall a single passage in it. It is because it was full of moments and days tragic, bitter, sinister in their warnings, dull or dreadful in their monotonous scenes and unseemly violences, that I can see or hear each separate incident in its detail, can indeed see or hear little else. So much in this place do men live by pain, that my friendship with you, in the way through which I am forced to remember it, appears to me always as a prelude consonant with those varying modes of anguish which each day I have to realise, nay more, to necessitate them even, as though my life, whatever it had seemed to myself and others, had all the while been a real symphony of sorrow, passing through its rhythmically linked movements to its certain resolution, with that inevitableness that in art characterises the treatment of every great theme. I spoke of your conduct to me on three successive days three years ago, did I not? I entertained you, of course. I had no option in the matter. But elsewhere, and not in my own home. The next day, Monday, your companion returned to the duties of his profession, and you stayed with me. Bored with Worthing, and still more, I have no doubt, with my fruitless efforts to concentrate my attention on my play, the only thing that really interested me at the moment, you insisted on being taken to the Grand Hotel at Brighton. The night we arrive you fall ill with that dreadful low fever that is foolishly called the influenza, your second, if not your third, attack. I need not remind you how I waited on you and tended you, not merely with every luxury of fruit, flowers, presents, books, and the like that money can procure, but with that affection, tenderness, and love that, whatever you may think, is not to be procured for money. Except for an hour's walk in the morning, an hour's drive in the afternoon, I never left the hotel. I got special grapes from London for you, as you did not care for those the hotel supplied, invented things to please you, remained either with you or in the room next to yours, sat with you every evening to quiet or amuse you. After four or five days you recover, and I take lodgings in order to try and finish my play. You, of course, accompany me. The morning after the day on which you are installed, I feel extremely ill. The doctor finds I have caught the influenza from you. There is no manservant to wait on me, not even anyone to send out on a message, or to get what the doctor orders. 
but you are there. I feel no alarm. The next two days you leave me entirely alone, without care, without attendance, without anything. It was not a question of grapes, flowers, and charming gifts. It was a question of mere necessities. And when I was left all day without anything to read, you calmly tell me that you bought the book I wanted, and that they had promised to send it down, a statement which I found by chance afterwards to have been entirely untrue, from beginning to end. All the while you are, of course, living at my expense, driving about, dining at the Grand Hotel, and indeed only appearing in my room for money. On the Saturday night, you having completely left me unattended and alone since the morning, I asked you to come back after dinner and sit with me for a little. With irritable voice and ungracious manner, you promised to do so. I wait till eleven o'clock, and you never appear. At three in the morning, unable to sleep and tortured with thirst, I made my way in the dark and cold down to the sitting-room in the hopes of finding some water there. I found you. You fell on me with every hideous word an intemperate mood an undisciplined and untutored nature could suggest. By the terrible alchemy of egotism, you converted your remorse into rage. You accused me of selfishness in expecting you to be with me when I was ill, of standing between you and your amusements, of trying to deprive you of your pleasures. You told me, and I know it was quite true, that you would come back at midnight simply in order to change your dress clothes and go out again. I told you at length to leave the room. You pretended to do so, but when I lifted up my head from the pillow in which I had buried it, you were still there, and with brutality of laughter and hysteria of rage, you moved suddenly towards me. A sense of horror came over me, for what exact reason I could not make out, but I got out of my bed at once, and, barefooted and just as I was, made my way down the two flights of stairs to the sitting-room. You returned silently for money, took what you could find on the dressing-table and mantelpiece, and left the house with your luggage. Need I tell you what I thought of you during the two lonely, wretched days of illness that followed? Is it necessary for me to state that I saw clearly that it would be a dishonour to myself to continue even an acquaintance with such a one as you had showed yourself to be? That I recognised that the ultimate moment had come, and recognised it as being really a great relief, and that I knew that for the future my art and life would be freer and better and more beautiful in every possible way. Ill as I was, I felt at ease. The fact that the separation was irrevocable gave me peace. Wednesday was my birthday. Amongst the telegrams and communications on my table was a letter in your handwriting. I opened it with a sense of sadness on me. I knew that the time had gone by when a pretty phrase an expression of affection, a word of sorrow, would make me take you back. But I was entirely deceived. I had underrated you. You congratulated me on my prudence in leaving the sick bed, on my sudden flight downstairs. It was an ugly moment for you, you said, uglier than you imagine. Ah, I felt it but too well. What it had really meant I do not know, whether you had with you the pistol you had bought to try to frighten your father with, and that, thinking it to be unloaded, you had once fired off in a public restaurant in my company, whether your hand was moving towards a common dinner-knife that by chance was lying on the table between us, whether forgetting in your rage your low stature and inferior strength you had thought of some special personal insult, or attack even, as I lay ill there. I could not tell. 
I do not know to the present moment. All I know is that a feeling of utter horror had come over me, and that I had felt that unless I left the room at once and got away, you would have done, or tried to do something, that would have been, even to you, a source of lifelong shame. On your return to town from the actual scene of the tragedy to which you had been summoned, you came at once to me very sweetly and very simply in your suit of woe, and with your eyes dim with tears. You sought consolation and help as a child might seek it. I opened to you my house, my home, my heart. I made your sorrow mine also, that you might have help in bearing it. Never even by one word did I allude to your conduct towards me, to the revolting scenes and the revolting letter. The gods are strange. It is not our vices only they make instruments to scourge us. They bring us to ruin through what in us is good, gentle, humane, loving. But for my pity and affection for you and yours, I would not now be weeping in this terrible place. Of course, I discern in all our relations not destiny merely, but doom, doom that walks always swiftly, because she goes to the shedding of blood. Through your father you come of a race, marriage with whom is horrible, friendship fatal, and that lays violent hands either on its own life or on the lives of others. In every little circumstance in which the ways of our lives met, in every point of great or seemingly trivial import in which you came to me for pleasure or help, in the small chances, the slight accidents that look, in their relation to life, to be no more than the dust that dances in a beam, or the leaf that flutters from a tree, ruin followed like the echo of a bitter cry, or the shadow that hunts with the beast of prey. Our friendship really begins with your begging me, in a most pathetic and charming letter, to assist you in a position appalling to any one, doubly so to a young man at Oxford. I do so, and ultimately, through your using my name as your friend with Sir George Lewis, I begin to lose his esteem and friendship, a friendship of fifteen years' standing. When I was deprived of his advice and help and regard, I was deprived of the one great safeguard of my life. You send me a very nice poem of the undergraduate school of verse for my approval. I reply by a letter of fantastic literary conceits. I compare you to Hylas or Hyacinth, Jonquil or Narcissus, or someone whom the great god of poetry favoured and honoured with his love. The letter is like a passage from one of Shakespeare's sonnets transposed to a minor key. It was, let me say frankly, the sort of letter I would, in a happy, if willful moment, have written to any graceful young man of either university who had sent me a poem of his own making, certain that he would have sufficient wit or culture to interpret rightly its fantastic phrases. Look at the history of that letter. It passes from you into the hands of a loathsome companion, from him to a gang of blackmailers, copies of it are sent about London to my friends, and to the manager of the theatre where my work is being performed. Every construction but the right one is put on it. Society is thrilled with the absurd rumours that I have had to pay a high sum of money for having written an infamous letter to you. This forms the basis of your father's worst attack. I produce the original letter myself in court to show what it really is. It is denounced by your father's counsel as a revolting and insidious attempt to corrupt innocence. Ultimately it forms part of a criminal charge. The Crown takes it up. The judge sums up on it with little learning and much morality. 
I go to prison for it at last. That is the result of writing you a charming letter. It makes me feel sometimes as if you yourself had been merely a puppet worked by some secret and unseen hand to bring terrible events to a terrible issue. But puppets themselves have passions. They will bring a new plot into what they are presenting, and twist the ordered issue of vicissitude to suit some whim or appetite of their own. To be entirely free, and at the same time entirely dominated by law, is the eternal paradox of human life that we realise at every moment, and this, I often think, is the only explanation possible of your nature, if indeed for the profound and terrible mystery of a human soul there is any explanation at all, except one that makes the mystery all the more marvellous still. I thought life was going to be a brilliant comedy, and that you were to be one of the graceful figures in it. I found it to be a revolting and repellent tragedy, and that the sinister occasion of the great catastrophe, sinister in its concentration of aim and intensity of narrowed will-power, was yourself stripped of the mask of joy and pleasure by which you, no less than I, had been deceived and led astray. The memory of our friendship is the shadow that walks with me here, that seems never to leave me, that wakes me up at night to tell me the same story over and over, till its wearisome iteration makes all sleep abandon me till dawn. At dawn it begins again. It follows me into the prison yard and makes me talk to myself as I tramp round. Each detail that accompanied each dreadful moment I am forced to recall. There is nothing that happened in those ill-starred years that I cannot recreate in that chamber of the brain which is set apart for grief or for despair. Every strained note of your voice, every twitch and gesture of your nervous hands, every bitter word, every poisonous phrase comes back to me. I remember the street or river down which we passed, the wall or woodland that surrounded us, at what figure on the dial stood the hands of the clock, which way went the wings of the wind, the shape and colour of the moon. There is, I know, one answer to all that I have said to you, and that is that you loved me, that all through those two and a half years during which the fates were weaving into one scarlet pattern the threads of our divided lives, you really loved me. Though I saw quite clearly that my position in the world of art, the interest that my personality had always excited, my money, the luxury in which I lived, the thousand and one things that went to make up a life so charmingly and so wonderfully improbable as mine was, were, each and all of them, elements that fascinated you and made you cling to me. Yet besides all this there was something more, some strange attraction for you. You loved me far better than you loved anyone else. But you, like myself, have had a terrible tragedy in your life, though one of an entirely opposite character to mine. Do you want to learn what it was? It was this. In you, hate was always stronger than love. Your hatred of your father was of such stature that it entirely outstripped, overgrew, and overshadowed your love of me. There was no struggle between them at all, or but little. Of such dimensions was your hatred, and of such monstrous growth. You did not realise that there was no room for both passions in the same soul. They cannot live together in that fair carven house. Love is fed by the imagination, by which we become wiser than we know, better than we feel, nobler than we are, by which we can see life as a whole, by which, and by which alone, we can understand others in their real 
as in their ideal relations only what is fine and finely conceived can feed love but anything will feed hate there was not a glass of champagne that you drank not a rich dish that you ate of in all those years that did not feed your hate and make it fat so to gratify it you gambled with my life as you gambled with my money carelessly recklessly indifferent to the consequences if you lost the loss would not you fancied be yours if you won yours you knew would be the exultation and the advantages of victory hate blinds people you are not aware of that love can read the writing on the remotest star but hate so blinded you that you could see no further than the narrow walled in and already lust-withered garden of your common desires your terrible lack of imagination the one really fatal defect in your character was entirely the result of the hate that lived in you subtly silently and in secret hate gnawed at your nature as the lichen bites at the root of some sallow plant till you grew to see nothing but the most meagre interests and the most petty aims that faculty in you which love would have fostered hate poisoned and paralysed the idea of your being the object of a terrible quarrel between your father and a man of my position seemed to delight you you scented the chance of a public scandal and flew to it the prospect of a battle in which you would be safe delighted you you know what my art was to me the great primal note by which i had revealed first myself to myself and then myself to the world the great passion of my life the love to which all other loves were as marsh water to red wine or the glow-worm of the marsh to the magic mirror of the moon don't you understand now that your lack of imagination was the one really fatal defect of your character what you had to do was quite simple and quite clear before you but hate had blinded you and you could see nothing life is quite lovely to you and yet if you are wise and wish to find life much lovelier still and in a different manner you will let the reading of this terrible letter for such i know it is prove to you as important a crisis and turning point of your life as the writing of it is to me your pale face used to flush easily with wine or pleasure if as you read what is here written it from time to time becomes scorched as though by a furnace blast with shame it will be all the better for you the supreme vice is shallowness whatever is realized is right how clearly i saw it then as now i need not tell you but i said to myself at all costs i must keep love in my heart if i go into prison without love what will become of my soul the letters i wrote to you at that time from holloway were my efforts to keep love as the dominant note of my own nature i could if i had chosen have torn you to pieces with bitter reproaches i could have rent you with maledictions the sins of another were being placed to my account had i so chosen i could on either trial have saved myself at his expense not from shame indeed but from imprisonment had i cared to show that the crown witnesses the three most important had been carefully coached by your father and his solicitors not in reticences merely but in assertions in the absolute transference deliberate plotted and rehearsed of the actions and doings of someone else on to me i could have had each one of them dismissed from the box by the judge more summarily than even wretched perjured atkins was i could have walked out of court with my tongue in my cheek and my hands in my pockets a free man 
the strongest pressure was put upon me to do so i was earnestly advised begged entreated to do so by people whose sole interest was my welfare and the welfare of my house but i refused i did not choose to do so i have never regretted my decision for a single moment even in the most bitter periods of my imprisonment such a course of action would have been beneath me sins of the flesh are nothing they are maladies for physicians to cure if they should be cured sins of the soul alone are shameful to have secured my acquittal by such means would have been a life-long torture to me but do you really think that you were worthy of the love i was showing you then or that for a single moment i thought you were do you really think that any period of our friendship you were worthy of the love i showed you or that for a single moment i thought you were i knew you were not but love does not traffic in a market-place nor use a huckster's scales its joy like the joy of the intellect is to feel itself alive the aim of love is to love no more and no less you were my enemy such an enemy as no man ever had i had given you my life and to gratify the lowest and most contemptible of all human passions hatred and vanity and greed you had thrown it away in less than three years you had entirely ruined me from every point of view after my terrible sentence when the prison dress was on me and the prison house closed i sat amidst the ruins of my wonderful life crushed by anguish bewildered with terror dazed through pain but i would not hate you every day i said to myself i must keep love in my heart to-day else how shall i live through the day i reminded myself that you meant no evil to me at any rate it all flashed across me and i remember that for the first and last time in my entire prison life i laughed in that laugh was all the scorn of the world prince fleur de lys i saw that nothing that had happened had made you realize a single thing you were in your own eyes still the graceful prince of a trivial comedy not the sombre figure of a tragic show had there been nothing in your heart to cry out against so vulgar a sacrilege you might at least have remembered the sonnet he wrote who saw with such sorrow and scorn the letters of john keats sold by public auction in london and have understood at last the real meaning of my lines i think they love not art who break the crystal of a poet's heart that small and sickly eyes may glare or gloat one cannot always keep an adder in one's breast to feed on one nor rise up every night to sow thorns in the garden of one's soul i cannot allow you to go through life bearing in your heart the burden of having ruined a man like me does it ever occur to you what an awful position i would have been in if for the last two years during my appalling sentence i had been dependent on you as a friend do you ever think of that do you ever feel any gratitude to those who by kindness without stint devotion without limit cheerfulness and joy in giving have lightened my black burden for me have arranged my future life for me have visited me again and again have written to me beautiful and sympathetic letters have managed my affairs for me have stood by me in the teeth of obloquy taunt open sneer or insult even i thank god every day that he gave me friends other than you i owe everything to them the very books in my cell are paid for by robbie out of his pocket money from the same source are to come clothes for me when i am released i am not ashamed of taking a thing that is given by love and affection i am proud of it 
but do you ever think of what friends such as moore Eddy, robbie robert sherard frank harris and arthur clifton have been to me in giving me comfort help affection sympathy and the like i know that your mother lady queensbury puts the blame on me i hear of it not from people who know you but from people who do not know you and do not desire to know you i hear of it often she talks of the influence of an elder over a younger man for instance it is one of her favourite attitudes towards the question as it is always a successful appeal to popular prejudice and ignorance i need not ask you what influence i had over you you know i had none it was one of your frequent boasts that i had none the only one indeed that was well founded what was there as a mere matter of fact in you that i could influence your brain it was undeveloped your imagination it was dead your heart it was not yet born of all the people who have ever crossed my life you were the one and the only one i was unable in any way to influence in any direction i waited month after month to hear from you even if i had not been waiting but had shut the doors against you you should have remembered that no one can possibly shut the doors against love forever the unjust judge in the gospels rises up at length to give a just decision because justice comes daily knocking at his door and at night-time the friend in whose heart there is no real friendship yields at length to his friend because of his importunity there is no prison in any world into which love cannot force an entrance if you did not understand that you did not understand anything about love at all write to me with full frankness about yourself about your life your friends your occupations your books whatever you have to say for yourself say it without fear don't write what you don't mean that is all if anything in your letter is false or counterfeit i shall detect it by the ring at once it is not for nothing or to no purpose that in my lifelong cult of literature i have made myself miser of sound and syllable no less than midas of his coinage remember also that i have yet to know you perhaps we have yet to know each other for myself i have but this last thing to say do not be afraid of the past if people tell you that it is irrevocable do not believe them the past the present and the future are but one moment in the sight of god in whose sight we should try to live time and space succession and extension are merely accidental conditions of a thought the imagination can transcend them and more in a free sphere of ideal existences things also are in their essence what we choose to make them a thing is according to the mode in which one looks at it where others says blake see but the dawn coming over the hill i see the sons of god shouting for joy what seemed to the world and to myself my future i lost irrevocably when i let myself be taunted into taking the action against your father had i dare say lost in reality long before that what lies before me is the past i have got to make myself look on that with different eyes to make the world look on it with different eyes to make god look on it with different eyes this i cannot do by ignoring it or slighting it or praising it or denying it it is only to be done fully by accepting it as an inevitable part of the evolution of my life and character by bowing my head to everything that i have suffered how far i am away from the true temper of soul this letter in its changing uncertain moods its scorn and bitterness 
its aspirations and its failures to realise those aspirations shows you quite clearly but do not forget in what a terrible school i am setting at my task and incomplete imperfect as i am yet from me you may have still much to gain you came to me to learn the pleasure of life and the pleasure of art perhaps i am chosen to teach you something much more wonderful the meaning of sorrow and its beauty your affectionate friend oscar wilde this letter of oscar wilde to lord alfred douglas is curiously self-revealing and characteristic while reading it one should recall oscar's provocation lord alfred douglas had driven him to the prosecution and then deserted him and left him in prison without using his influence to mitigate his friend's suffering or his pen to console and encourage him the abandonment was heartless and complete the letter however is vindictive in spite of its intimate revelations oscar took care that his indictment should be made public the flagrant self-deceptions of the plea show its sincerity oscar even accuses young alfred douglas of having induced him to eat and drink too much the taproot of the letter is a colossal vanity the bitterness of it wounded egotism the falseness of it a self-righteous pose of ineffable superiority as of a superman oscar denies to alfred douglas imagination scholarship or even a knowledge of poetry he tells him in so many words he is without brain or heart then why did he allow himself to be hag-ridden to his ruin by such a creature yet how human the letter is how pathetic end of section to lord alfred douglas de profundis extract from the bibliography of oscar wilde by stuart mason this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In an unpublished letter to a friend, written from Reading Prison in the early part of 1897, Wilde gives the following explanation of his contributing to The Chameleon. One day, blank, came to me, and asked me as a personal favour to him to write something for an Oxford undergraduate magazine about to be started by some friend of his, of whom i had never heard in all my life and about whom i knew nothing at all to please blank what did i not always do to please him i sent him a page of paradoxes destined originally for the saturday review a few months later i found myself standing in the dock of the old bailey on account of the character of the magazine it formed part of the crown charge against me I was called upon to defend blank's friend's prose and his own verse the former i could not palliate the latter i loyal to the bitter extreme to his youthful literature as to his youthful life did very strongly defend and would not hear of his being a writer of indecencies but i went to prison all the same for his friend's undergraduate magazine and the love that dare not speak its name end of section to lord alfred douglas de profundis extract from the london daily herald nineteenth of april nineteen thirteen this librivox recording is in the public domain jury feel tired the jury intimated that they had thought enough of the manuscript had been read it was therefore arranged that the last two pages should be read his friendship with the person he was addressing was described by the writer as a real symphony of sorrow when lord alfred douglas was lying ill of that low fever called influenza at brighton the writer said i need not remind you how i nursed you gave you every luxury and lavished on you an affection tenderness and love not to be procured by money reference was made in the manuscript to wilde's illness which followed close on that of his friend 
and he complained that the latter neglected him while i was lying there you were driving about dining at the grand hotel and only appearing in my room for money the brutality of his laughter another passage read was at the brutality of your laughter and the hysteria of your brain a sense of horror came over me i got out of bed made my way barefooted down the stairs to the sitting-room and did not return to my room until i was told you were gone wilde says in the document but for my pity for you and yours i would not now be in a prison cell i was spurred on by your taunts to take action against your father rather than sever your friendship with me read another quotation you said you would give up your allowance of three hundred and fifty pounds a year and this you thought was the most chivalrous friendship and touching noblest self-denial but you would not give up your wine or suppress your luxuries or extravagancies the eight days we were in paris cost for you myself and your italian servant one hundred and fifty pounds you said you loved me far better than you loved anybody else the manuscript went on and you met me when you had had a terrible tragedy in your life it was your nature that hate always followed love and your hatred of your father was such that it stultified overgrew and overshadowed your love for me there is no room for both passions in the same soul they cannot live together in the same house gambling with his life you gambled with my life as you gambled with my money was another extract carelessly recklessly when you lost the loss was not yours if you won you took all the gains in the last two pages of the manuscript the writer said i wait month after month to hear from you there is no prison in any world into which love cannot force an entrance write to me about yourself your life your friends your occupation your books wrote wilde whatever you have to say for yourself say it without fear don't write what you don't mean if there is anything counterfeit in what you say i shall detect it at once i have yet to know you perhaps we have yet to know each other don't be afraid of the past if people tell you it is culpable don't believe them end of section to robert ross first of april eighteen ninety seven version one from the selected prose of oscar wilde this librivox recording is in the public domain wilde gives directions about de profundis h m prison reading april first eighteen ninety seven my dear robbie i send you a manuscript separate from this which i hope will arrive safely as soon as you have read it i want you to have it carefully copied for me there are many causes why i wish this to be done one will suffice i want you to be my literary executor in case of my death and to have complete control of my plays books and papers as soon as i find i have a legal right to make a will i will do so my wife does not understand my art nor could be expected to have any interest in it and cyril is only a child so i turn naturally to you as indeed i do for everything and would like you to have all my works the deficit that their sale will produce may be lodged to the credit of cyril and vivian well if you are my literary executor you must be in possession of the only document that gives any explanation of my extraordinary behaviour when you have read the letter you will see the psychological explanation of a course of conduct that from the outside seems a combination of absolute idiocy with vulgar bravado some day the truth will have to be known not necessarily in my lifetime 
but I am not prepared to sit in the grotesque pillory they put me into for all time, for the simple reason that I inherited from my father and mother a name of high distinction in literature and art, and I cannot for eternity allow that name to be degraded. I don't defend my conduct, I explain it. Also, there are in my letter certain passages which deal with my mental development in prison, and the inevitable evolution of my character, and intellectual attitude towards life, that has taken place, and I want you and others who still stand by me, and have affection for me, to know exactly in what mood and manner I hope to face the world. Of course, from one point of view, I know that on the day of my release I shall be merely passing from one prison into another, and there are times when the whole world seems to me no larger than my cell, and as full of terror for me. Still, I believe that at the beginning God made a world for each separate man, and in that world which is within us we should seek to live. At any rate, you will read those parts of my letter with less pain than the others. Of course, I need not remind you how fluid a thing thought is with me, with us all, and of what an evanescent substance are our emotions made. Still, I do see a sort of possible goal towards which, through art, I may progress. It is not unlikely that you may help me. As regards the mode of copying, of course it is too long for any amanuensis to attempt, and your own handwriting, dear Robbie, in your last letter, seems specially designed to remind me that the task is not to be yours. I think that the only thing to do is to be thoroughly modern and to have it typewritten. Of course, the manuscript should not pass out of your control, but uh, could you not get Mrs. Marshall to send down one of her typewriting girls? Women are the most reliable, as they have no memory for the important. To Horton Street or Fillimore Gardens, to do it under your supervision. I assure you that the typewriting machine, when played with expression, is not more annoying than the piano when played by a sister or near relation. Indeed, many among those most devoted to domesticity prefer it. I wish the copy to be done not on tissue paper, but on good paper such as is used for plays, and a wide, rubricated margin should be left for corrections. If the copy is done at Haunton Street, the lady typewriter might be fed through a lattice in the door, like the cardinals when they elect a pope, till she comes out on the balcony and can say to the world, Habet mundus epistolam, for indeed it is an encyclical letter, and as the bulls of the Holy Father are named from their opening words, it may be spoken of as the Epistola in carcere et vinculis. In point of fact, Robbie, prison life makes one see people and things as they really are. That is why it turns one to stone. It is the people outside who are deceived by the illusions of a life in constant motion. They revolve with life and contribute to its unreality. We who are immobile both see and know. Whether or not the letter does good to narrow natures and hectic brains, to me it has done good. I have cleansed my bosom of much perilous stuff, to borrow a phrase from the poet whom you and I once thought of rescuing from the Philistines. I need not remind you that mere expression is to an artist the supreme and only mode of life. It is by utterance that we live. Of the many, many things for which I have to thank the governor, there is none for which I am more grateful than for his permission to write fully and at as great a length as I desire. For nearly two years I had within a growing burden of bitterness, of much of which I have now got rid. On the other side of the prison wall there are some poor, black, soot-besmirched trees that are just breaking out into buds of an almost shrill green. 
I know quite well what they're going through. They are finding expression. Ever yours, Oscar. Letter from Reading Prison to Robert Ross. End of section. To Robert Ross, 1st of April, 1897, version 2, from the Catalogue of the Dalau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 11, from Reading, dated April 1st, 97, four pages, full scap, closely written. This is a specially important letter. It is with great regret that we have decided that its contents are so extremely intimate and personal, and likely to wound the feelings of persons still living, if such private affairs were exposed to public perusal, that we refrain from quoting more than about one-fourth of its contents. Sufficient is said, however, to indicate that the manuscript about which he conveyed such definite instructions, and for which he showed such solicitousness, was De Profundis, which he calls here by the title which he himself gave it, Epistola in Carcere et Winculis. It must have been particularly exasperating for Ross at the time to have all these instructions about a manuscript which the governor of the jail refused to allow him to have, it is now well known that this manuscript was not in his possession until handed to him by Wilde on the day of Wilde's release. I send in a roll separate from this my letter, which I hope will arrive safe. I want you to have it carefully copied for me. I want you to be my literary executor in case of my death, and to have complete control over my plays, books, and papers. As soon as I find I have a legal right to make a will, I will do so. I turn naturally to you, as indeed I do for everything, and would like you to have all my works. The deficit that their sale will produce may be lodged to the credit of Cyril and Vivian. Well, if you are my literary executor, you must be in possession of the only document that really gives any explanation of my extraordinary behaviour, when you have read the letter, you will see the psychological explanation of a course of conduct that, from the outside, seems a combination of absolute idiocy with vulgar bravado. Some day the truth will have to be known, not necessarily in my lifetime, but I am not prepared to sit in the grotesque pillory they put me into for all time, for the simple reason that I inherited from my father and my mother a name of high distinction in literature and art. I don't defend my conduct, I explain it. Also there are in the letter certain passages which deal with my mental development in prison, and the inevitable evolution of character and intellectual attitude towards life that has taken place. And I want you and others who still stand by me, and have affection for me, to know exactly in what mood and manner I hope to face the world. Of course, from one point of view, I know that on the day of my release I shall be merely passing from one prison into another, and there are times when the whole world seems to me no larger than my cell, and as full of terror for me. Still, I believe that at the beginning God made a world for each separate man, and in that world, which is within us, one should seek to live. At any rate, you will read those parts of my letter with less pain than the others. Of course, I need not remind you how fluid a thing thought is with me, with us all, and of what an evanescent substance are our emotions made, Still, I do see a sort of possible goal towards which, through art, I may progress. It is not unlikely that you may help me. As regards the mode of copying, of course it is too long for any amanuensis to attempt, and your own handwriting, dear Robbie, in your last letter, seems especially designed to remind me that the task is not to be yours. I may wrong you, and hope I do, but it really looks as though you were engaged in writing a three-volume novel on the dangerous prevalence of communistic opinions among the rich, or in some other way wasting a youth that I cannot help saying has always been, 
and will always remain quite full of promise i think that the only thing to do is to be thoroughly modern and to have it typewritten of course the manuscript should not pass out of your control but could you not get mrs marshall to send down one of her typewriting girls women are the most reliable as they have no memory for the important i assure you that the typewriting machine when played with expression is not more annoying than the piano when played by a sister or near relation indeed many among those most devoted to domesticity preferred it then follow detailed instructions as to the way in which the manuscript is to be typed and to whom the typed copies should be sent he asks for one to be sent to himself he also wants one copy of the better parts sent to the lady of wimbledon if the copying is done at haunton street the lady typewriter might be fed through a lattice in the door like the cardinals when they elect a pope till she comes out on the balcony and can say to the world habet mandus epistolam for indeed it is an encyclical letter and as the bulls of the holy father are named from their opening words it may be spoken of as the epistola in carcere et vinculis prison life makes one see people and things as they really are that is why it turns one to stone it is the people outside who are deceived by the illusions of a life in constant motion they revolve with life and contribute to its unreality we who are immobile both see and know i have cleansed my bosom of most perilous stuff to borrow a phrase from the poet whom you and i once thought of rescuing from the philistines it is by utterance that we live for nearly two years i had within me a growing burden of bitterness much of which i have now got rid of on the other side of the prison wall there are some poor black soot-smirched trees that are just breaking out into buds of an almost shrill green i know quite well what they are going through they are finding expression the letter proceeds to quarrel with ross for disregarding wilde's instructions about his wife you thought that the thing to do was the clever thing the smart thing the ingenious thing you were under a mistake life is not complex we are complex life is simple and the simple thing is the right thing further discussion of the quarrel proceeds which shows wilde to be of the kind and considerate nature which was always attributed to him by those who knew him best even had i any legal rights and i have none how much more charming to have privileges given to me by affection than to extort them by threats he goes on to discuss his conviction and admits its justice and also to discuss the danger that his friends have incurred of his being sued for divorce also i would take it as a great favour if more would write to the people who pawned or sold my fur coat since my imprisonment and ask them from me whether they would be kind enough to state where it was sold or pawned as i am anxious to trace it and if possible get it back i have had it for twelve years it was all over america with me it was at all my first nights it knows me perfectly and i really want it i hope to see frank harris on saturday week or soon the news of the copying of my letter will be welcome when i hear from you ever yours signed oscar wilde end of section to robert ross sixth of april version one from de profundis nineteen o seven keller edition this librivox recording is in the public domain january sixth eighteen ninety six my dear robbie consider now my dear robbie my proposal i think my wife who in money matters is most honourable and high-minded will refund the seventy-five pounds paid for my share i have no doubt she will but i think it should be offered from me and that i should not accept anything in the way of income from her 
I can accept what is given in love and affection to me, but I could not accept what is doled out grudgingly, or with conditions. I would sooner let my wife be quite free. She may marry again. In any case, I think that if free, she would allow me to see my children from time to time. That is what I want. But I must set her free first, and had better do it as a gentleman by bowing my head and accepting everything. You must consider the whole question, as it is through you and your ill-advised action it is due, and let me know what you and others think. Of course you acted for the best, but you were wrong in your view. I may say candidly that I am getting gradually to a state of mind when I think that everything that happens is for the best. This may be philosophy, or a broken heart, or religion, or the dull apathy of despair, but, whatever its origin, the feeling is strong with me. To tie my wife to me against her will would be wrong. She has a full right to her freedom, and not to be supported by her would be a pleasure to me. It is an ignominious position to be a pensioner on her. Talk over this with Moredi. Get him to show you the letter I have written to him. Ask your brother Alec to give me his advice. He has excellent wisdom on things. Now to other points. I have never had the chance of thanking you for the books. They were most welcome. Not being allowed the magazines was a blow, but Meredith's novel charmed me. What a sane artist in temper! He is quite right in his assertion of sanity as the essential in romance. Still, up to the present, only the abnormal have found expression in life and literature. Rossetti's letters are dreadful, obviously forgeries by his brother. I was interested, however, to see how my granduncle's Melmoth and my mother's Sidonia have been two of the books that fascinated his youth. As regards the conspiracy against him in later years, I believe it really existed, and that the funds for it came out of Hake's bank. The conduct of a thrush in Chain Walk seems to be most suspicious, though William Rossetti says, I could discern nothing in the thrush's song at all out of the common. Stevenson's letters are most disappointing also. I see that romantic surroundings are the worst surroundings possible for a romantic writer. In Gower Street, Stevenson could have written a new Trois Mousquetaires. In Samoa, he wrote letters to the Times about Germans. I see also the traces of a terrible strain to lead a natural life. To chop wood with any advantage to oneself, or profit to others, one should not be able to describe the process. In point of fact, the natural life is the unconscious life. Stevenson merely extended the sphere of the artificial by taking to digging. The whole dreary book has given me a lesson. If I spend my future life reading Baudelaire in a café, I shall be leading a more natural life than if I take to Hedger's work or plant cacao in mud swamps. En route is most overrated. It is sheer journalism. It never makes one hear a note of the music it describes. The subject is delightful, but the style is, of course, worthless, slipshod, flaccid. It is worse French than Onet's. Onet tries to be commonplace and succeeds. Heisman tries not to be, and is. Hardy's novel is pleasant, and Harold Frederick's very interesting in matter. Later on, there being hardly any novels in the prison library for the poor imprisoned fellows I live with, I think of presenting the library with about a dozen good novels. Stevenson's, none here but the Black Arrow, some of Thackeray's, none here, Jane Austen, none here, and some good Dumas Père-like books, by Stanley Wayman, for instance, and any modern young man. 
You mentioned Henley had a protégé. Also the Anthony Hope man. After Easter you might make out a list of about fourteen and apply to let me have them. They would please the few who do not care about De Goncourt's journal. Don't forget I would pay myself for them. I have a horror myself of going out into a world without a single book of my own. I wonder would there be any of my friends, such as Cosmo Lennox, Reggie Turner, Gilbert Burgess, Max and the like, who would give me a few books. You know the sort of books I want. Flaubert, Stevenson, Baudelaire, Maeterlinck, Dumas Père, Keats, Marlowe, Chatterton, Coleridge, Anatole France, Gautier, Dante, and all Dante literature, Goethe and Goethe literature, and so on. I would feel it a great compliment to have books waiting for me, and perhaps there may be some friends who would like to be kind to me. One is really very grateful, though I fear I often seem not to be. But then remember that I have had incessant worries besides prison life. In answer to this, you can send me a long letter all about plays and books. Your handwriting, in your last, was so dreadful that it looked as if you were writing a three-volume novel on the terrible spread of communistic ideas among the rich, or in some other way wasting a youth that always has been, and always will remain, quite full of promise. If I wrong you in ascribing it to such a cause, you must make allowances for the morbidity produced by long imprisonment. But do write clearly, otherwise it looks as if you had something to conceal. There is much that is horrid, I suppose, in this letter, but I had to blame you to yourself, not to others. Read my letter to Moore. Harris comes to see me on Saturday, I hope. Remember me to Arthur Clifton and his wife, who, I find, is so like Rossetti's wife, the same lovely hair, but, of course, a sweeter nature. Though Miss Siddle is fascinating, and her poem A1. Yours ever, Oscar. End of section. To Robert Ross, 6th of April, version 2, from the Catalogue of the Delau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 13, from Reading, dated April 6th, four pages, folio. Addressed, My dear Robbie, the names of the mystical books in en route fascinate me. Try and get some of them for me when I go out. Also try and get me a good life of St. Francis of Assisi. He mentions with great feeling the kindness of his wife's coming from Genoa to break to him the news of his mother's death. Strangely enough, a large part of this letter is a recapitulation sometimes in almost identical words, of the previous letter, and discusses the prospect of divorce as almost certain. I must live in England if I am to be a dramatist again, but it would be a bestial infamy to again send me to a prison for offences that in all civilised countries are questions of pathology and medical treatment, I am gradually getting to a state of mind when I think that everything that happens is for the best. This may be philosophy, or a broken heart, or religion, or the dull apathy of despair, but whatever its origin, the feeling is strong with me. To tie my wife to me against her will would be wrong. She has a full right to her freedom, and not to be supported by her would be a pleasure to me. I have not had the chance of thanking you for the books. They were most welcome. Not being allowed the magazines was a blow, but Meredith's novel charmed me. What a sane artist in temper! He is quite right in his assertion of sanity as the essential in romance. Still, up to the present, only the abnormal have found expression in life and literature. Rossetti's letters are dreadful, obviously forgeries by his brother. I was interested, however, to see how my grand-uncle's Melmoth 
and my mother's Sidonia had been two of the books that fascinated his youth. As regards the conspiracy against him in later years, I believe it really existed, and that the funds for it came out of Hake's bank. The conduct of a thrush in Chain Walk seems to me most suspicious, though William Rossetti says, I could observe nothing in the thrush's song at all out of the common. Stevenson's letters most disappointing also. I see that romantic surroundings are the worst surroundings possible for a romantic writer. In Gower Street, Stevenson could have written another Trois Mousquetaires. In Samoa, he wrote letters to the Times about Germans. I see also the traces of a terrible strain to lead a natural life, to chop wood with any advantage to oneself or profit to others. One should not be able to describe the process. In point of fact, the natural life is the unconscious life. Stevenson merely extended the sphere of the artificial by taking to digging. The whole dreary book has given me a lesson. If I spent my future life reading Baudelaire in a cafe, I should be leading a more natural life than if I took to Hedger's work or planted cacao in mud swamps. En route is most overrated. It is sheer journalism. It never makes one hear a note of the music it describes. The subject is delightful, but the style is, of course, worthless, slipshod, flaccid. It is worse French than Onet's. Onet tries to be commonplace and succeeds. Heisman tries not to be and is. Hardy's novel, pleasant, and Frederick's, very interesting in matter. Later on, there being hardly any novels in the prison library for the poor imprisoned fellows I live with, I think of presenting the library with about a dozen good novels. Stevenson's, none here but the Black Arrow, some of Thackeray's, none here, Jane Austen, none here, and some good Dumas Père-like books, by Stanley Wayman, for instance, and any modern young man. You mentioned Henley had a protégé, also the Anthony Hope man. After Easter you might make out a list of about fourteen and apply to let me have them. They would please the few who do not care about Goncourt's journal. Don't forget I would pay myself for them. I have a horror myself of going out into a world without a single book of my own, I wonder would there be any of my friends who would give me a few books, such as Cosmo Lennox, Reggie Turner, Gilbert Burgess, Max, and the like. You know the sort of books I want. Flaubert, Stevenson, Baudelaire, Maeterlinck, Dumas Père, Keats, Marlowe, Chatterton, Coleridge, Anatole France, Gautier, Dante, and all Dante literature, Goethe, and Ditto, and so on. I would feel it a great compliment to have books waiting for me. You can send me a long letter all about plays and books, but do write clearly, otherwise it looks as though you had nothing to conceal. There is much that is horrid, I suppose, in this letter, but I had to blame you to yourself, not to others. F. Harris comes to see me on Saturday, I hope. Signed, yours, Oscar. End of section. Toward a Martin from the Catalogue of the Delau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 17. A collection of odd notes, all of which were written to warders during Wilde's imprisonment. They are written on odd, dirty scraps of paper, backs of envelopes, etc., and some have the warder's reply on the back. A. Fragment written on the inside of an envelope. My dear friend, what have I to write about, except that if you had been an officer in Reading Prison a year ago, my life would have been much happier. Everyone tells me I am looking better and happier. That is because I have a good friend who gives me the chronicle, 
and promises me ginger biscuits. Signed, O. W. There is a pencil note by Martin at the foot. B. Another such fragment. You must get me his address some day. He is such a good fellow. Of course I would not for worlds get such a friend as you are into any danger. I quite understand your feelings. The Chronicle is capital today. You must get A32 to come out and clean on Saturday morning, and I will give him my note then myself. On the back is a penciled answer by Martin. C. Still another fragment. Please find out for me the name of A211, also the names of the children who are in for the rabbits, and the amount of the fine. Can I pay this and get them out? If so, I will get them out tomorrow. Please, dear friend, do this for me. I must get them out. Think what a thing for me it would be to be able to help three little children. I would be delighted beyond words. If I can do this by paying the fine, tell the children that they are to be released tomorrow by a friend, and ask them to be happy and not to tell anyone. D. I hope to write about prison life and to try and change it for others, but it is too terrible and ugly to make a work of art of. I have suffered too much in it to write plays about it. This note is written on the inside of an envelope addressed to the Governor of Reading. E. So sorry you had no key. Would like a long talk with you. Any more news? End of section. To Robert Ross, 13th of April, 1897. From the Catalogue of the Delau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 14. From Reading. Dated April 13th, 1897. Addressed to My Dear Robbie. Eight pages, folio. I am sorry that the last visit was such a painful and unsatisfactory one. To begin with, I was wrong to have blank present. He meant to be cheery, but I thought him trivial. Everything he said, including his remark that he supposed time went very fast in prison, a singularly unimaginative opinion, and one showing an entirely inartistic lack of sympathetic instinct, annoyed me extremely. Then your letter of Sunday had, of course, greatly distressed me. You and Moore had both assured me that there was enough money waiting for me to enable me to live comfortably and at ease for eighteen months or two years. I now find that there is exactly fifty pounds, and that perforce, out of this, have to come the costs of two solicitors who have already had long interviews with Mr. Hargrove and incurred much expense. The balance is for me. My dear Robbie, if the fifty pounds covers the law costs, I shall be only too pleased. If there is any balance remaining, I don't want to know anything about it. Pray, don't offer it to me. Even in acts of charity, there should be some sense of humour. You have caused me the greatest pain and disappointment by foolishly telling me a complete untruth. How much better for me had you said to me, Yes, you will be poor, and there will be worse things than poverty. You have got to learn how to face poverty. Simply, directly, and straightforwardly. But when a wretched man is in prison, the people who are outside either treat him as if he was dead, and dispose of his effects, or treat him as if he was a lunatic, and pretend to carry out his wishes, and don't or regard him as an idiot to be humoured, and tell him silly and unnecessary lies, or look on him as a thing so low, so degraded, as to have no feelings at all, 
a thing whose entire life in its most intimate relations is to be bandied about like a common shuttlecock in a vulgar game in which victory or failure are of really little interest as it is not the life of the players that is at stake but only someone else's life you did not tell me the truth you and my friends did not carry out my directions and what is the result instead of two hundred pounds a year i have a hundred and fifty pounds instead of one third of the interest which on the death of my wife's mother would amount to about fifteen hundred pounds a year i have no more than a bare one hundred and fifty pounds to the end of my days my children will have six hundred or seven hundred pounds a year apiece their father will remain a pauper but that is not all that is merely the common money side my life is to be ruled after a pattern of respectability my friends are to be such as a respectable solicitor would approve of i owe this robbie to your not telling me the truth and not carrying out my instructions and the grotesque thing about it all is that i now discover when it is too late to do anything that the entire proceedings have been done at my expense that i have had to pay for advice and opinions worthless and pernicious so that out of a hundred and fifty pounds given to more aidy for my use nothing now remains at all but i suppose about one pound ten shillings six pence don't you see what a wonderful thing it would have been for me had you been able to hand me the hundred and fifty pounds on my coming out on wednesday how welcome such a sum would have been of what incalculable value now the whole thing without my permission being asked is spent in a stupid and ill-advised attempt in making discord in promoting estrangement a great deal more in this strain follows recapitulating the stupidity and injustice of his friends i have written bitterly about frank harris because he came down to make gorgeous offers of his cheque-book to any extent i required and then sent a verbal message to say he had changed his mind in the whole of this law business my life was being gambled for and staked on the board with utter recklessness flaubert once made la bêtise humaine incarnate in two retired solicitors or solicitors clerks called bouvard et percuchet the opinions of my secret solicitor if collected would prove a serious rival to flaubert's grotesques for sheer crass stupidity they if correctly reported are perfectly astounding he then proceeds to detail the incredibly stupid actions which were advised and allowed blank tells mr hargrove that a large sum of money is at my disposal and that i am in no want of money at all it is supposed o oh, sancta simplicitas that this will overawe mr hargrove and prevent his bidding against you the sole result is that mr hargrove tells my wife that he has it on the authority of blank, that i am going to be in no want of money so that there is not the smallest necessity for increasing the one hundred and fifty pounds so my wife writes to me at christmas and advises me to invest the money in an annuity so as to increase my income she naturally supposed that it was about three thousand pounds something that one could buy an annuity with so did i i find that the entire sum was a hundred and fifty pounds of which everything except about thirty-five shillings has to go in lord expenses the other clever lie is to pretend to mr hargrove that you are not my agents but quite independent people while assuring the registrar of bankruptcy that you are really my agents as for me you tell me that you are acting independently 
but I find it is with my money. More Aidy really expected Mr. Hargrove to believe in the ridiculous comedy. I need hardly say that Mr. Hargrove was not taken in for a single moment. Nothing could exceed the heroism with which you exposed me to danger. The letter goes on to deplore in detail and seriatim all the misfortunes which have been brought upon him as the result of acting against his advice. In point of fact, Robbie, you had better realise that of all the incompetent people on the face of God's earth in any matter requiring wisdom, common sense, straightforwardness, ordinary intelligence, blank, is undoubtedly the chief. I have written to him a letter about himself which I beg you will at once go and study. He is cultivated, he is sympathetic, he is kind, he is patient, he is gentle, he is affectionate, he is full of charming emotional qualities, he is modest, too much so, about his intellectual attainments. I value his opinion of a work of art far more than he does himself. I think he should have made, and still can make, a mark in literature. But in matters of business he is the most solemn donkey that ever stepped. He has neither memory nor understanding, nor capacity to realise a situation or appreciate a point. His gravity of manner makes his entire folly mask as wisdom. Everyone is taken in. He is so serious in manner that one believes he can form an intellectual opinion. Now I have realised this, I feel it right, Robbie, that you should know it. He is incapable, as I have written to him, of managing the domestic affairs of a tom a hedge for a single afternoon. You are a dear, affectionate, nice, loving fellow, but, of course, in all matters requiring business faculty, utterly foolish. I didn't expect advice from you. I merely expected the truth. Come when you like to this place near Havre. You shall be as welcome as a flower, and attacked till you know yourself. You have a heavy atonement before you. Signed, Yours, O. W. Lot 15. From Reading. Undated. Two pages. Folio. Addressed to Dear Robbie. A long and important letter anticipating his release and giving detailed instructions as to preparations, etc. See illustration number 5, page 29. I now hear that Dieppe has again been decided on. I dislike it, as I am so well known there, but I can move on, I suppose. I believe you are to be there. Very well, it will give me pleasure to see you. But it is much better that blank should not be with us, as I know I could not restrain myself from discussing the terrible position in which I have been placed through his want of practical intelligence and legal knowledge. With you, while your initial error had fatal consequences, of course you have no business capacity. I would not like you if you had, so I can't blame you. I hope abroad to talk about lovely things. We have been friends for many years. If at Dieppe you can find a place about ten miles off by rail where we could go, a little quiet place, please do so. I am well known at all the Dieppe hotels, and of course my arrival will be telegraphed to London. I see you then at Dieppe. Signed, yours, Oscar. End of section. End of Letters of Oscar Wilde, Volume 3, 1895-1897.